Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to call this meeting to order. Uh, it is 9.34. We will take a break at uh, noon till 1.30 for uh, lunch, and we will adjourn at uh, 5 p.m. At this time, I would like to uh, acknowledge that uh, uh, that we meet on the traditional land of TD6 territory and acknowledge the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as Cree, Dene, Sotu, Blackfoot, Nkurasu, as well as Meti and Inuit, and now settlers from around the world. And I will do a roll call of committee members, Councillor Stevenson. Good morning. Councillor Knack. Good morning. Councillor Rice. Good morning. Councillor Rutherford. Good morning. And we have Councillor Salvador with us. Good morning. Uh, Councillor Prince Bay. Good morning. Uh, Councillor uh, Cartmel. Good morning. Councillor uh, Wright. Good morning. And I'll see if there are other council members joining us. Uh, just give me a second. Councillor Tang. Good morning. And that's about it for now. Okay. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Who would like to move that adoption of? Councillor Rutherford, you want to do that? Sure. Um, I move the adoption of the October 12th, 2022 Executive Committee meeting as presented. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Please uh, vote. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. Adoption of the minutes, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. I'll move the approval of the September 28th, 2022 Executive Committee meeting. Okay, any errors or omissions? Seeing none, please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Any protocol items? Seeing none, items for discussion. So select items for debate. Colleagues, please sign up. Councillor Rutherford. <clears throat> Thank you. I would like to select item 7.6. 7.8 7. and 9.1. Okay, uh, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll select 7.1. Um, and I think because we have speakers on 7.4. Oh, to answer questions only. Okay, that's Yeah, I we only need to select that if uh, it is. Uh, I mean, it's okay. I, I think. Councillor um, Prince Bay, you have some questions on, okay, uh, Councillor Rice, go ahead. Um, so you go right to left. No. 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 Okay. Uh, I would like to select a 7.4. Okay. Okay. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. No. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay. All right. Uh, that is all the selection. So 7.1, 7.4, 7.8, 7. 7. 6. 7.8 and 9.1. Does 9.2 needs to be selected? Yes. Okay. I will select. I will select 9.2. Yeah. Okay. 
Got it. Okay, can someone move the rest, please? Councilor Nack? So moved. Thank you, Councilor Nack. Please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Can you please lead us back? Uh, yes. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This morning, Executive Committee has approved the recommendations in the following report without debates. 7.2, SAP Ariba subscription renewal. Item 7.3, non-competitive single source agreement, Canada Post. Item 7.5, extension of sole source transit agreement. And item 7.7, .7, ward boundary policy review. Okay, thank you. Uh, request to speak. We have a number of people here to speak. Councillor Rutherford, do you want to sure. move that, please? Yeah, uh, I move that executive committee hear from the following speakers and panels where appropriate on item 7.1, progress land development at Blatchford. Kaylin Anderson with Urban Development Institute. Two, uh, Susan Keating with Urban Development Institute, remote, and Adil Kodian. Canadian Home Builders Association uh, remote. On item 7.4, Evan Evansdale surplus school site, Izam Saleh, uh, the Muslim Association of Canada, Mac School, to answer questions only, remote. And on 7.8, employee psychological health and safety programs and practices, Randy Thorne, the Edmonton, the Greater Edmonton Alliance in person, Joanne Kobilak, Kobe Ka, sorry if I'm butchering that name, the Edmonton, the Greater Edmonton Alliance in person, and Philip Penrod, the Edmonton, the Greater Edmonton Alliance in person. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Rutherford. Please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. A request for a specific time on agenda. Mm. So we don't have any, right? Just noting we don't have any requests, but we do have 9.2 as time specific at 1.30 p.m. Yeah, 9.2 will be at 1.30 as approved uh, part of the agenda. Uh, so for the folks who are here on uh, 7.8, are the folks here? Uh, those three uh, people registered to speak. Uh, we may not get to you for a while, so but you're welcome to stay and watch the proceeding on other items because uh, there are a number of other items that are ahead of that item that is scheduled. You're okay with that? Okay, cool. I know this is how the process works. Uh, we'll see. We'll see how we do on the agenda. Good. Thanks. Consular inquiries. Any consular inquiries? Seeing none. Uh, report, reports to be dealt to with a different meeting, none. A request to reschedule, none. Uh, unfinished business, none. Now we go into our first item on the agenda, which is uh, progress land development at Blatchford. Morning, Mr. Mayor, members of committee. Uh, we have short introdu introductory comments. Uh, Tom Lumsden, our development manager for Blatchford, will deliver them. Tom um, joined Blatchford a few years ago and brings uh, 12 years of private development experience. Has been great in terms of advancing Blatchford from a, from a development activity on the city's behalf. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thanks, Adam, and good morning, everybody. Uh, in 2010, City Council set an exciting and ambition, ambitious vision for this land. It's a vision to transform 536 acres of former airport land into an urban community in the heart of Edmonton, designed to be a great neighborhood for families, a catalyst for transformational land development, and a path towards a more resilient future. In 2014, City Council approved the business plan for the community. At the same time, Council also positioned the City of Edmonton as the land developer. The approved business case provided development activity assumptions which anticipated residential units would start to be built in 2015. 
These numbers provide a moment in time assumption and we acknowledge they were too aggressive for three main reasons. Administration needed to develop custom zoning, architectural controls and green building codes to serve as the guiding documents for the development of the community. This customization of processes and documentation was required to achieve different outcomes in the neighborhood. Council did not approve a district energy sharing system until December 2016. After the approval, administration needed to engineer, design and construct this critical infrastructure for the community. And while the Blatchford office is part of the City of Edmonton, it is required to follow the same development approval process as a private land developer. In order to achieve the goals outlined in the business plan, additional time was needed for design and approvals of engineering documentation that varied from the design and construction standards. It is critical to note that while ambitious timelines were stated in the business case, the actual development timelines on site are in alignment with that of the development sector. The last plane left Blatchford on November 30th, 2013, and the first resident moved in on October 24th, 2020. It took seven years to go from an active airport to a community where people were living. Administration was able to bring Blatchford's first parcels to market in 2018. Given the large size of the site and in compa comparison to other land development projects with less ambitious goals, administration believes a 20 to 25 year development timeline is still a reasonable target. As per council's direction, administration engaged key members of the development industry to determine if additional partnerships with private sector entities to develop some or all of the remaining undeveloped land while maintaining current density, energy, sustainability, and green building requirements would result in faster development on site. The developers we spoke to noted the ambitious goals of the community. However, the group indicated they are not interested in acting as a land developer for the neighborhood if they were required to achieve council's vision for Blatchford. In addition to adjusting the original vision, there are a number of other considerations for selling off undeveloped land to private land development industry. That would need to be examined further, including impact to existing home builders and residents, loss of cohesive community design, and loss of ability to control other identified City of Edmonton goals, including provision of 16% affordable housing. While administration's research has shown that the development timelines are in line with private land development, we are committed to continuously refining process and requirements to advance development on the site as fast as reasonably possible while maintaining a positive financial outcome and council's vision. As a land developer, we service the residential par stages and our home builders, our home building partners build, price and sell homes based on overall housing market conditions. Currently, the Blatchford office has six stages of land development underway on the west side of the site Work and work is also underway to service 33 acres of land for Nate on the east side of the community. Blatchard is a bold and transformational project that further, furthers multiple city building initiatives including Connect Edmonton, the City Plan, and the Energy Transition Strategy and Action Plan. Based on Council's original direction, administration is following a development approach that prioritizes long-term investments in density, design, city building, and climate resilience over short-term profit. Given the current plans in place, Blatchford will achieve Council's vision to develop a complete community that is designed with purpose and that will play a critical role in Edmonton's plans for growth in the coming decades. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving that uh, uh, opening uh, remarks. Uh, we will go to members of the public who are here to speak. So if you don't mind, please uh, stepping back. Uh, Kaylin Anderson, joining remotely. Kaylin, are you there? I am, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Susan Keating, uh, joining remotely. Are you there, Susan? Yes, thank you, I'm here. Okay, Adil Kodian, are you there, Adil? Yes, I'm Okay, good. Yes, I'm here. Each, each of you will have five minutes to make your presentation, and after that, committee members and council members may have questions to you, and so please uh, uh, stay if you can. Uh, we will start with Kaylin Anderson. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kaylin and I'm the Executive Director of the Urban Development Institute for the Edmonton Metropolitan Region. On behalf of our more than 160 members, I'm pleased to provide feedback on the progress made to date for the Blatchford development and wish to expand on the summary of industry input described in the Executive Committee report before you today. To begin, we'd like to commend successive City Councils for advancing a vision to enable the comprehensive redevelopment of the lands in Blatchford starting with the planning that began in 2008, followed by the, the official closure of the city center airport in 2013. 
This decision opened up a major infill opportunity, which aligns with the modern direction outlined in the city plan and industry uh, appreciates the development vision uh, for Blatchford. But we do caution that if it's rigidly implemented, it prevent, presents many unique constraints that have already and will continue to slow development relative to other community development projects. The report before you reiterates a desire to keep the original scope and public sector driven business model in place, which means that plan amendments or changes to the business case will not be contemplated. In our experience, as we have seen in Edmonton's developing and redeveloping neighborhoods, any community that is expected to build out over the period of several decades needs to evolve and adjust over time to respond to changes in the market, technology and demographics. For all developments, the private sector looks strategically at their plans at least once per year to adjust projections and, where warranted, shift investment strategies, implementation tactics, and priorities accordingly. Employing this type of adaptive approach for Blatchford would not mean a full departure from the vision, but finding new pathways to enable key outcomes responsibly and responsibly. When it comes to private sector comparables, we believe that more in-depth study is warranted. The report summarizes the current financial picture for Blatchford, which has required $214 million in capital and operating investments over the last decade and has only yielded $23 million in return to date. Between January 1st of 2018 to September 30th of 2022, building permits were issued for 149 housing units in Blatchford, while almost 48,000 units were issued over the same time period for Edmonton overall. The subset of these that refers to infill uh, approximates 14,000. So th those would be in the core mature neighborhoods. The sole private sector example that was provided as a point of reference was for the Summerside neighborhood. Summerside saw 376 units added over the same time frame, So that's more than double. Based on this pace and progress, the Blatchford project is not performing in alignment with the private sector expectations in terms of financial targets, speed to market and market uptake. One key difference in approach from a traditional private sector driven project is that none of the 10 goals outlined in the business case relate to financial sustainability or viability. As previously stated, industry is not opposed to the vision for this community, <clears throat> but it must be implemented in a timely manner to justify the expenditure relative to return on investment and in consideration of the time value of money. In discussions with city administration over the summer of 2022, there did not appear to be an appetite to recommend potential changes to the existing business model or development approach to enable new partnerships. Industry members noted then, as we have previously, that the current state is not financially viable from a private land developer perspective. And we submit to, to you, arguably this is the case from a taxpayer's perspective as well. City administration recently retired its real estate advisory committee, REAC, which is a group, which was a group of land developers and consultants who were tasked with providing volunteer insight and feedback to the city on projects, policies, and processes. As this forum is no longer in operation, as your city building partners, UDI, and uh, other members of the development industry more broadly, would be pleased to provide advice on how to bring this community to market more rapidly and efficiently. Rather than providing council and administration with perspectives on an issue by issue basis, we do welcome a, a collaborative venue to share our experiences and expertise to ensure a more holistic approach is advanced. Our industry would be pleased to work with you to provide the expertise on how this project could be better catalyzed over the coming years. We welcome the opportunity to connect on the ideas um, that we've raised here and also in more detail in our letter uh, with council and administration. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time today and would be pleased to answer any questions. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, we will go to Susan Keating. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Keating, and I'm the board chair for the Urban Development Institute, UDI. Um, I'm also the vice president at Melcor, and our company has been developing communities across the Edmonton region in some form or another for the last 100 years. And we are also active in many other markets across Western Canada. So it's within this context that I'd like to share a couple of high level thoughts about the market and comparability of Blatchford with private development initiatives. Consumer demand ultimately drives market uptake in terms of both speed and volume. This happens regardless of whether a project is led by the public or led by the private sector. 
As the developer, the city has selected a market lane for this project that is very narrow and specific, which leads to a struggle to support sales velocity. A community of 100% multifamily housing for a target population of 30,000 people in a single geographic location will struggle to develop consistently over a 20 year time frame in Edmonton's market. Regardless of whether it is the city or a private developer advancing the project, this type of market lane will limit the timely build out of development. This is unlikely to change if the project stays in this current lane. Private sector developers may have selected a wider market spectrum than the city had in order to generate a return on investment and to stimulate consistent momentum. The reason why private developers are not expressing interest in the current program is not that we do not share and value the social and environmental objectives of this project. Rather, the issue is that developers cannot afford to advance a project that is not economically supported by appropriate volumes of consumer demand, particularly at a time when consumer demand for attainable housing is so high. In Edmonton, our affordability advantage is a key strategic asset to attracting talent from across Edmonton as other major markets face housing crises. There's an opportunity here for Blatchford to play a role in that. The province of Alberta has recently launched the Alberta is Calling campaign and Edmonton's housing affordability is central to that pitch. Blatchford provides an excellent opportunity for our community to answer this call but only if it's developed in a timely manner and at, a, at an affordable price point and offers products that meets the needs that consumers are demanding. Currently, housing in Blatchford is approximately twice as expensive as direct comparables in developing neighborhoods within the city and the region. As of September, the median selling price for a townhouse in Edmonton was around 380,000 whereas a comparable product in Blatchford is selling for over 700,000. This really shrinks the number of potential buyers, which increases the expected length of the development timeframe for this community. We believe that council and administration could consider some new strategies to expedite the sustainable development of this important community. The question posed to the private industry on this project to date essentially boils down to would you be interested in taking on portions of this project as is and under the current business model? Instead, we think a better question to ask would be, what actions could be taken to stimulate growth and investment to bring Blatchford to a necessary project delivery and pacing while maintaining the overall vision of a sustainable community as approved by council? A wider array of solutions can be found by asking more questions and seeking creative alternatives. If not, the lands will continue to develop more slowly and phases will continue to be subsidized by the tax base over the foreseeable future. This is a really important project for Edmonton and we're eager to see it through to completion. We welcome the opportunity to connect on ideas and solutions with council and administration. Thank you so much for your time today. I'll be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for joining us. Next, we will go to Adil Kodian. Um, good morning, members of the Executive Committee. Um, my name is Adil Kodian, and I'm here today on behalf of the Canadian Home Builders Association Edmonton Region. I am an active member of the association as a director on the board and an executive vice president of the Royal Group of Companies, which builds homes and communities right across Canada. Our members built more than 80% of the new homes in Edmonton in 2021. I would like to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our members. There were approximately 1,300 new home permits issued in 2021 in Northwest Edmonton. 62% of those were single family homes, 32%, 38% were row townhomes and semi detached. These new homes were distributed in 46 neighborhoods with McConaughey at the top with 300 plus permits of mostly single family homes. The Blatchford business plan assumptions of 250 in 2015 and 500 on 2018 onwards would have been difficult or impossible to achieve for a neighborhood that doesn't meet the needs for the majority of the market. So scenario A presented in attachment four is similarly infeasible. In scenario A, the project is forecasting making $37 million a year from selling six hectares of land a year. 
that works out to two and a half million dollars an acre. That's an infeasible price assumption for the land price. Given the Blatchford target density and let's adjust for some normal pricing of land, Blatchford would need to sell between 375 and 625. This is just a rough calculation to make $37 million. So if that happens, Blatchford would then be beating the best performing, best performing neighborhood in the quadrant while still excluding the product type that most of the buyers wanted in 2021. That's very unlikely. In scenario B, which is the scenario where they contemplate, where the contemplation is of selling land to the private sector, basically 50% more land is being serviced and sold. So supply increases, but there's no demand increase. So scenario B as presented is therefore unlikely to be any better than scenario A. Adjusting for reality in terms of price and velocity and demand, we don't come to the conclusion that there would be a net surplus for either scenario. Lastly, the utility is forecasting a net operating loss of $2 million in 2022, but a cash flow positive position in 2025. Well, if absorptions fall far short of the plan, the loss would likely continue and has to be accommodated for in this particular forecast of the project. Overall, our opinion is that the rigidity of Blatchford's prescriptive requirements, lack of choice, affordability, and adequate commercial amenities in its current state has created strong barriers for financial viability. Our recommendations are the following. Hire an independent third party to produce a report on Blatchford's feasibility. The report has to consider all costs, including the capital and operating costs of the utility. Then a lot more detail has to be provided in the report than is currently provided to enable uh, groups like us to do a proper analysis. All revenues must also be considered. The report should provide a comparison between keeping the existing status quo versus creating a gradual transition path. We do not believe there is a financially viable path forward without some adjustments to Blatchford's model. Blatchford should ideally target a middle ground where a significant reduction in emissions is targeted in such a way that the average Edmontonian can still afford to live there. Currently, Blatchford has a long list of uh, fairly laudable goals, but none of those goals are being achieved without houses being built and people actually living there. The reality is that the next step may not be instant carbon neutrality, but a more car gradual option that meets environmental goals without ignoring what the market and the buyers are demanding and can actually afford. Our association has always said that the path to energy efficiency is a transition and not a leap. It is not possible to realize the transformative change Blatchford is aiming for unless the community is financially viable and sustainable and occupied with thousands of homes. Our industry and the association are aligned with the continuous improvement philosophy towards improving energy efficiency in housing. But we have to consider affordability, financial viability, and consumer preferences. As experts in the home building business, we want to help Blatchford reach its energy efficiency goals in an affordable manner and to improve the city where we work and live. We're willing and able to make um, uh, make Blatchford more attainable for home builders and home buyers, and welcome a collaborative opportunity that has that provides more time to help come up with solutions to this challenging problem. Thank you for uh, for hearing me out. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for your presentation, all three of you, and uh, we'll check if committee members and council members have any questions. And if council members, committee members have questions, please sign up now. Councillor Rutherford, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, Councillor Stevenson, you selected this. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure, thank you. Thank you so much to our uh, three speakers for being here today. Really appreciated the, uh, the comments and, and insights. Um, maybe Ms. Anderson, I'll just speak with you. So, um, you know, my understanding from the report is that the, the city is proposing to sort of uh, re-forecast every year, sort of take more of that annual um, forecasting approach that I think you outlined as being part of the, the private sector. Just want to confirm that's something you think is, is the right direction to be moving in. Yep, for sure. Reforecasting is is the right thing to do, but then also following up on that with making changes uh, based on that forecast would be the second step to take. Great, and just just maybe you know it was really helpful to see sort of the cost comparisons uh, with other uh, products, other townhome duplex products. Um, 
And, and I think affordability is gonna be a conversation this morning for sure with our administration. But I just want to confirm the, the costs that you noted, the 383, I know that you know a feature of a lot of the Blatchford homes is that they do have secondary and garden suites. Just wondering if that would be comparable across uh, the numbers that you've provided. Well, the, the comparison was from the most recent information from the real estate board, uh, which was describing the uh, median cost of a townhouse slash row house um, at 3D3. It, I don't think it got into the detail of whether or not there was a, a, a suite attached, but uh, if, we, if you wanted that, we could dig in with them and get that more nuanced um, information. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think that could be that could be interesting. Also, the garden suites. I mean, I think there's that that affordability, that long term affordability piece with not only some of the the rental revenue that can be generated from the units, but also just the lower lower operating costs um, uh, over the long run with with utilities. But thank you, uh, Ms. Keating, maybe I'll, I'll switch to you. So it's a really interesting question that you've brought up around, you know, the 100 percent multifamily and what I think I'm hearing from from uh, the, the speakers this morning is this desire that we need to see single detached housing um, in in the mix, and I think you know I think I think that's that's interesting. I guess a question for me is that I think that that there's a there's a more holistic perspective of affordability that I think we need to take, particularly in this role, which is the long term. Uh, tax affordability of different development scenarios. And I think a challenge um, that I'm aware of that maybe you could speak to is that sort of over the long run, we don't always recoup um, the cost of delivering city services in a, in a single detached housing area. So just wondering if you could maybe comment on that. You spoke about subsidi subsidization by the tax base at Blatchford, but I, I, I think that there's a degree to which that may happen in other uh, communities as well in the long term when we look at those lower density forms. Sure, um, and just to clarify, I actually didn't, um, it, and maybe I, I wasn't clear, but I didn't actually um, specify that single family dwellings was what was um, a part of our suggestion. I mean, maybe that's something that could be looked into and we'd be happy to be part of that conversation. But um, I was I was just, um, I guess, confirming that the plan for Blatchford is to be 100% multifamily, not saying uh, that it shouldn't be necessarily. Um, and, and I think my comment about um, the, the subsidy by the tax base is, is was, mainly just speaking to the fact that currently the the costs um and for the foreseeable future like far outweigh the revenue and so um that that was that was the only point i was saying um, okay. not okay. necessarily indefinitely but currently yeah and that's that's mm -hmm. a great question and i i, I was curious if I mean, my understanding is that community development is a lot of upfront cost that, um, you know, you're really not making, you're not making your money on the first house or the first lot that you sell. It's, it's, uh, it's a much longer term proposition. So just wondering for a comparable private sector development at, at this stage of development, would you anticipate a similar um, balance between sort of investment uh, and maybe uh, borrowing and lending versus the the revenue returned at this point. I think every community would develop kind of at a different um, pace and and with a different um, I guess requirement for for funding up front, depending on um, you know, the required infrastructure for the community to get it going. But I would say at this point, kind of high level, it would be um, expected to be kind of turning turning your mind to kind of like a net positive um, scenario. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Uh, Councillor Rutherford. Yes, thank you to our speakers. <clears throat> I, I'm not sure if this would be better for Canadian home builders or UDI. Um, cause I know, but I'll go to Ms. Anderson first. Uh, you mentioned about the comparative in the attachment to Summerside and I, I like that, but I actually find that the Grease Spa would be a better comparative because it is also Canada lands, which is a public owned development. Do either, do you know of what that unit uptake rate is for Grease Spa? Like, have you had those conversations? Um, Councillor, I, 
I looked at it yesterday um, online and then didn't write it down. It is about <laughs> double. Um, so I apologize. It can be checked. Um, it's a lot faster. I would also say, though, you know, I mean, yeah, Grease Ball is a really interesting case um, because it is Canada lands. The other one, Exhibition, isn't developing, and there are, you know, 350 neighborhoods in Edmonton. So I was a bit baffled by why uh, one single, almost entirely built out neighborhood was chosen as the basis of comparison. But you'll see that even in Grease Ball, it's outperforming. Yeah, well, because I, I, I think it's the most comparative to this, just in terms of it also has very specific build regulations, right, in terms of uh, certain things to keep that historical military um, look and feel. So I feel like when we're, we're comparing to the most, uh, so if you could get that number for me, I would greatly sorry. Ap appreciate that. If, and Adil, if I, yeah, sorry, you can jump in. Sorry, too. if I can jump in, uh, Grease Pop built from, this is the data that I have in front of me. I'm not 100% certain it's complete, but Grease Pop built 70, uh, had 78 permits applied for last year. I'd say about 80% of those were single family houses, 70, 80%, and then the rest were uh, townhomes and like multi-unit multi -unit product, uh, row houses and townhomes mostly. Yeah, in talking with Marvin, definitely the, the market demand is still for the single family homes for sure, I understand that. Um, but it was interesting, another thing I wanted to talk about is at the last public hearing, we actually had a really in-depth conversation about uh, a more dense uh, build out in Glenora. And in that we had talked about how historically in some of the other communities that are experiencing affordability issues, their lack of willingness to densify some of the core neighborhoods was, was one of the reasons that the affordability actually spiked. So Vancouver is the example that was provided at that public hearing. So I wonder, you know, when you mentioned a deal, you know, the need uh, for meet, meeting with the market and that the market right now is really single family homes. What are your thoughts on that kind of count, that, that contrast with affordability and what, we're see, what we saw historically in other, in other major cities that are now dealing with an affordability issue? I, I think the, the somewhat of an answer to that is you can make single family housing very affordably and you can make multifamily housing very unaffordably. So $700,000 multifamily housing is unaffordable for the average Edmonton, Edmontonian. In fact, very few, so very sm a very small percentage in Edmonton can actually afford that particular price. Um, you can buy single family homes in other communities for quite a bit cheaper than what is available out there. And um, even taking an opportunity to answer a previous question, even with suites and income producing suites and everything included, um, there's lots of opportunities for way under 700,000 to purchase a townhome in a ton of communities in Edmonton. Um, so I, I, I think density is one factor that goes into affordability think, of housing. There's, but do you think there's a specific market or demographic that Blatchford appeals to that is unique to other um, comparators on the market right now. So is there is there a niche that it fills that isn't filled anywhere else? So if you're asking, is there a premium multifamily market segment that would buy this uh, buy into Blatchford, they would. So if you look at Blatchford's absorption of 149 units, one could argue that it met 100% of the possible market it could possibly satisfy. Very now, the question is, if there's 30,000 homes to go, um, at 149 in two years, uh, it'll be a while. Yeah, that's fair. I appreciate that perspective. Uh, thank you for, for your time today. And again, thank you for everybody that came to speak. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, thank you and for coming to speak. Uh, so my question will focus on the development model and the financial model. And specifically, and then Council approved the vision back to 2010, and the business plan approved back to 2014. I heard some concern from your speak, and then do you have a specific suggestion based on what's current state, and our development model is implement, and then can be improved, and from like the 
consumer demanding perspective from a, like financial target perspective? Is there anything and then you can uh, specifically give more details how we can make some change or any improvement for our current development model? So if that is uh, something you can provide it. Um, um, to to miss like uh, uh, any of you could be answer this question from your uh, professional background. So, sorry. Um, I, I think, uh, Councillor Rice, this would be a fairly longer long conversation to sort of get into a little bit more detail. But I, I think our recommendation stands for what it is, which is adjusting Blatchford's goals to be a little bit more gradual, picking a percentage of homes that need to be uh, meeting all the requirement, percentage of homes that don't need to meet all the requirements, creating achievable targets, right? If uh, uh, building 100 homes um, with target X and building 1,000 homes with target Y may achieve the same climate or the emission reduction goals or climate change goals, but in one scenario, the subdivision is feasible. The other scenario, the subdivision isn't. So um, it's not a straightforward answer, if that makes sense. Um, then my follow-up question, and because our city current development model and uh, took seven years, and from initial development until the first home uh, owner move in, and then if the adjustment or change could happen, do you think how many years would it would take and for the private uh, developer and then from beginning and to the homeowner to move in? So I, I really look at that development timeline. And because when we look at the current vision, the current business plan, and then I would like to say uh, what's a change, what adjustment could better achieve the goal already set up there? Councillor, maybe I'll give it a shot. I, I think what we're recommending is that this is a question that should be asked. So you're actually asking the question we're saying, please ask. Um, uh, so we can't answer it because it's a hard question. And because I have Mike for just a quick sec, Councillor Rutherford, I did the, the search, 885 units in Greece, Boston, 2018. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, I will follow up uh, asking uh, the question and and it's specific for me and then to look at the report if we want to make some change or adjustment and even between the two different approach here and for the comparison and if we go back to talk about financial targets and the city demonstrate right now we for the investment we have return and it's 30 $8.8 .8 million for that net, uh, we call the uh, net pre president value and NPV. But if we take the different approach, we actually come with a deficit. So I don't know how that could be justified. And if we so look at the development model to make some updates and change, but look at the financial return, but actually return is not better than the current situation. So I just want to get a better understanding and how we justify that. So, um, Councillor Rice, I, I did a little bit of calculation prior to this. I do not have all the information, so it's a little difficult for me to do the math there, but I just adjusted the land price to a more realistic one and a half million an acre. And I, and I said, you know, I still want to make the same um, same sort of volumetric sales in terms of in, in, in terms of land. Um, the revenue at the end, or the total land sales revenue drops from, I think, about 756 to about 450. So correcting, assuming everything else stays the same, which I don't know if it does, um, that would be a negative 124. So the issue is it's neither sustainable in option A nor in option B. That's the struggle. Now, that said, the analysis is just a quick back of the envelope thing, and we, we would need a lot more data and a lot more time to do it properly, if that's the question. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I'll start with uh, Kaelin Anderson. Uh, I understand that at the initial stages of the development, uh, private sector interest was sought, and I also understand that at that time, private land developers thought that unless the 
restrictions on density are relaxed and uh, sustainability requirements are relaxed, they were not interested in participating. So what has changed from now to then, from then to now, that private sector will be interested now without compromising the density and the sustainability features? Thank you, Your Worship. I've spoken with uh, many of the developers who are part of those initial conversations. And what I would say is that it, the feedback is remarkably consistent. At the time, the feedback was we can't participate if this will not be in any way profitable and will be a money loser. The private sector just can't do that. Um, but whether how, the city does or not is really not our business, but this, the private sector cannot. And so they've actually said the exact same thing 10 years later. So how would the private sector be able to do it now without compromising density and sustainability and still be profitable? Well, I think we're saying that compromise is in order. Uh, so, you okay. know, it's not about compromising sustainability, but again, to Mr. Cotian's point about energy transition being a transition instead of a leap, um, you know, building up expectations over time as technology catches up, for example, or contemplating different forms of development. I will be the one to put it out there. Yes, there is probably opportunity for some single detached housing in this very large plot of land, especially in light of the fact that you don't build a neighborhood once, what's not one and done. Um, neighborhoods need to be structured to be developed and redeveloped over and over again as per the city plan's goal of a rebuildable city. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate your comments about energy transition being a transition, but some would argue that we need to have a leap approach. The way the buildings do cause a lot of emissions, uh, right? So uh, I want to get back to Grease Bar. Uh, uh, 885 permits since 2018. Do we know how much time it took for Grease Bar to be where it is now? When, when, did, in develop, when did development start in Grease Bar? Do we know? Maybe a better question for admin, but I think the plan was approved in the very early 2000s. So it would be about 20 Yeah, so, years ago. So there was probably a lot of delay earlier on, and now things are speeding up, which we hear from the administration on Blatchford as well, right? There was early hiccups, and we'll ask those questions to administration now that things are speeding up. So I just want to get a sense that why is this different than Grease Bar? Even I, like, I'm more familiar with Summerside, for example, I live in South, Southeast, and that development took decades to be where it is now, right? So I just try to understand if we can achieve sustainability features, create more density, maybe move a little bit slower than private sector, at the same time set some standards, maybe learn from those standards into the future, maybe make it easier for private sector to implement and replicate some of those standards in the future developments that will save them time and, and money, right? So just trying to get a sense from you or maybe from Adil on, uh, on, 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 on this, uh, this, this approach. Maybe I'll go maybe to Maybe I'll Adil. start it and pass it over to, to Adil. Um, the, the difference between the different neighborhoods is that there's all just one type of housing here and it's very expensive housing, so it's going to absorb less quickly. Um, the other question about sustainability is that I think it's a balancing act because the, the, the less amount of time that we have people living in these homes or the longer it takes to get people into these homes, the more other types of homes are being built. So it's not like a, a, a zero sum game where we're waiting for development to happen in Blatchford or we won't get no. development. It will simply yeah. go elsewhere. So I guess that, that's part of the consideration for you to wait. Yeah. Good. No, I, I Adil, quickly, because I have one more question. So, sorry, just the, the issue is like slow is okay, but if, if uh, 30,000 people have to live there and we are consuming at 100 uh, houses a year, let's say, it would be more than 100 years to go through the subdivision. That's the challenge. Okay, I think slow is okay. But. Good. And uh, on the affordability, shouldn't we look at affordability in a holistic way? For example, housing is one cost, but transportation is a huge cost for households. In this case, having access to sustainable modes of transportation reduces the overall cost for households, which improves affordability. Shouldn't we start looking at a more holistic approach, just not just housing? Maybe to uh, Kaylin. 
Yes, you're absolutely right, uh, Your Worship. In fact, in the city plan, there is a target to consider the cost of housing uh, and transportation okay. together at 36%. Currently, housing takes up, takes up about um, 29 to 30% of that. Yeah. And what we're saying is the cost of Blatchford is double. So it's okay. not like, um, so that's 5% difference um, between, you know, it's not 50% uh, or 100% difference. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here, uh, all three of you. Uh, I'll go to Council Cartmel next. Thank you. Uh, thanks uh, to our speakers for uh, for joining us today. A lot of a lot of the questions I have been asked, um, uh, and maybe just in summary, what I'm hearing is that uh, there's a lack of, of of a spectrum of choice of different housing forms on Blatchford, and that's going to slow the pace. Essentially, all our eggs are in this multi-family basket, and a very expensive basket at that. So I'm just going back to some of the information offered. Um, there was not quite fourteen thousand. Uh, housing unit starts in the four-year period uh, in the core. In other words, infill starts. Do you know? Do we know how many of those were multifamily or were uh, single-family? Councillor, it, it would be an easy thing to check, but it's too hard for me to check it on the fly. But I just yeah. a quick shout out to your administration. Your open data is awesome. <laughs> Uh, and I, and a, you know, an associated question to that is what the average cost is. So, and, and you know what, because it's, if, I guess I'll go back to one of the comments uh, that Ms. Keating made, and that is that, you know, one of the competitive advantages that Alberta, uh, and more specifically Edmonton has, is the, is the cost of housing relative to other places in Canada. If nothing happens at Blatchford, we still have that affordability advantage, don't we? It's just at the edges. Is that fair to say? Yes, I think that's fair to say. And so I guess the question is, is do we want to make that affordable housing uh, choice available in the, you know, more in the core and more in the infill neighborhoods, or do we want to keep it out in the new subdivisions? And that's, a, a, I guess, the, the value proposition that administration has in front of us or council has in front of us. Yeah? All right. Well, um, maybe then to Mr. Kodian. Uh, the other aspect that I'm hearing about this is that these, this, this lane of housing is very, very expensive. Do you have a sense of what's driving that, that cost? Uh, what's making it, uh, make, making these homes so expensive to purchase? Um, the, uh, my, my first glance would be the technical requirements that are posed by, uh, posed by the, uh, posed by the subdivision, um, uh, would be the vast majority of the cost. The second element is. Uh, there's always going to be like last year there were 26 available homes. So this is one of those. There's always going to be 26 people who are willing to, in Northwest Edmonton that are willing to pay 750,000 for a townhome because it meets these very unique features. There's unlikely to be 200. And just going back to your earlier comment, Councillor Cartmel, uh, Edmonton is affordable. There are affordable products in infill as well as in suburbia. The question to ask is, should we as should should the you know, the municipality or Blatchford be in the provision of housing to probably the top 10% or 5% of uh, the wealthiest home buyers in Edmonton. Right, I understand that, but the question I had for you is what's driving that cost? And you said it's the technical requirements. So more yeah, specifically, what technical requirements? Because we're hearing on the one hand that there's, there's different pathways. If there was a, a greater spectrum of housing, that there's pathways to achieve in general terms the ecological responsibility goals and the density goals of Blatchford. But on the other hand, you're saying there's a technical requirement piece that, that strips away the affordability. So, so where is that buried? So, okay, so I, I, yeah. there's like a thick set of requirements of, which is called the green building code that is available for Blatchford. I have not recently costed out uh, personally, but we are able to get back to you with sort of what the cost delta would be for construction for this particular type of product. Okay, uh, I guess then to Ms. Anderson, I, I understood you to say, you know, more or less on behalf of the industry that you thought a better question uh, to ask uh, would be, you know, would be a more collaborative approach and, you know, a, a discussion ar around uh, different pathways or alternative, I guess, alternative pathways or, or modified approaches to see the pace and volume of development increase. So if, if there was an opportunity uh, provided to industry that said we want to we maintain or nearly maintain the environmental goals, 
We want to maintain or nearly in, uh, maintain the density goals, but otherwise it's a blank slate. Would industry respond with uh, expressions of interest, with ideas on how we can achieve those, those goals, but create a better, a better pace and a better volume of development? Would, that, would industry welcome that? Yes, I think that's uh, very possible and, and likely. Just to be clear, industry is not um, asking to become part of the development program in Blatchford. We're, we're simply providing our expertise based on all of the development that's happening throughout the region. But I, I think that the, the door would be open there. The one thing I might add, Councillor, um, is that the Blatchford ARP is probably the only plan that I can think of that has not had any changes made to it since it was first adopted. So um, opening up that kind of way of thinking, um, uh, every other Tuesday at, at city at public hearing, you're looking at plans and it's being adjusted and, and this one has never been adjusted. So uh, some openness to that would be step one, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Cartmel. Councillor Salvador. Well, thank you, um, Mayor. Oh, yep. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, and thanks so much to our speakers for being here today. Um, so I'll start with, um, I'll start with, with Ms. Anderson, better. <laughs> uh, so in the report, there were several opportunities that were identified for, for faster realization of development. Um, and opportunity two in particular, I wanted to ask you about that uh, because it talks about the potential to bring large sections of land to market for large home builders. Um, and, and of course it recognizes that administration will continue to sell land to the current home builder group, but there's an opportunity to bring larger home builders to the community. Um, and in order to do that, there would be sort of an expectation of uh, a larger commitment for a critical mass of land. And I, I guess, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on that and if that might uh, be a, a helpful path forward. I'm actually, if you don't mind, going to pass the microphone here to Adel because I sure. think that he's done the research on how much market is available regardless of who develops it. Sure. I, I think the, the, the comment I would make is, would other home builders be interested in purchasing large tracts of land anywhere in Edmonton? The answer is yes, there would be. But the, the, the fundamental problem is releasing 50% more land without changing the constraints that prevent the land from satisfying the demand that's in the market doesn't help in any way. If, if, you know, if, if we build 100 homes and they are not financially viable, Building 150 won't make them any more financially viable. It, I, I don't think there's a way to get around adjusting the leap to a transition. Once that adjustment is done, um, uh, to the to the previous speaker's comments about um, adjusting the plan over here, then there is this conversation of okay, now how much of the demand can the can Blatchford capture? Assume 1,300 to 1,500 to maybe even 1,800 homes are built in the quadrant. How much of this can Blatchford capture? If Blatchford can only satisfy a third of the market, Blatchford can never capture 100% of all of those homes, and it's not even likely. So that would be my answer. So it's a demand analysis, but based on how much of the demand can we actually ever satisfy? Okay, well, I, I appreciate that answer, and I guess I, I would just want to dig into to some of those constraints, and particularly you know, interested in... Um, in our, our green building standards, carbon neutrality, and definitely hearing from speakers that, yeah, there's a desire for more, I guess, a gradual transition or middle ground. Um, but my my understanding is that there are numerous industry members who are, you know, delivering net zero products at scale. And I, I'm just, yeah, trying to square that. You know, why not here? Um, my understanding is that industry is is ready and is already taking these steps. Maybe I'll, I'll give it a, a start here as well and maybe pass the mic again. I don't think it's that the industry is not, not ready, uh, Councillor. We're, we're actually seeing development happen not only in Edmonton but all over the country and in the world. The question is what are people willing and able to pay for? Um, the market is very price sensitive and right now uh, if we were to go to like step five of the building code based on our kind of analysis that we did with build alberta that would add just by virtue of that alone adding seventy seven thousand dollars onto a door so seventy seven thousand dollars is not nothing um for um especially as interest rates are rising and the median household income right now is about a hundred thousand dollars so it's there's it's really about it's not about can we do it it's will people be able to buy it and do they value <sighs> 
do they value it literally in terms of taking on that extra mortgage um, relative to having a very comparable home with some of those less features in a different location for half the price? That's truly the market uh, situation that we're in. Okay, um, and I, yeah, at the same time, I'm, I'm just reflecting on our, our ambitious energy transition goals, which of course are, are very, very important and critical as well. And um, I guess beyond, beyond the energy efficiency and green building standards that, that are included, uh, also looking for a bit of commentary on some of the architectural features and standards, uh, whether, like, are those a, sort of a perceived barrier or is it mostly the density and energy uh, efficiency pieces? I, I, I would say that they are all bits and pieces of the story. So that the, the the answer would be there's some changes to the energy, like the energy standards. There's some changes to the building code. There's some changes required to the architectural standards and product types, and they all add up to actually making the subdivision more feasible. Okay. Well, I'm uh, out of time. Thank you for those answers. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. I'll go now to Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a, a question in regards to some of the, sorry, some of the assumptions made um, in attachment four. It references um, that the um, private developers would not be contributing to site-wide infrastructure. Is this, I mean, you know, the industry does um, develop in, in other areas as well, parks and ponds and things like that. I'm just wondering, would this be the, the take from the development industry? Um. So, so that is one of the, the concerns that I noted in the analysis as well. So in option B, revenue goes down by $248 million, but expenditure goes down only by like 70, 75 million bucks. Seems that, seems odd. Uh, why would the expenditure not somewhat go with the land sale? So maybe there's, you know, there's the analysis needs to be somewhat examined a little bit to see if that is accurate. Um, typically, the servicing inside the piece of land would be expectedly going with sort of the land sale. Yeah, because I mean it's partially serviced and, and other infrastructure in there, but but there's still some that that does need to be completed, right? Okay, um, and then I just also um, you'd reference the, the the current prices between the townhomes, um, sort of the average and and what it what it costs in Blatchford. What about single family? Um, I again, a thing I looked up yesterday, and my bad memory fails me, but I think it's about four fifty range for an average single family. Adel's giving me the hands up. Okay, good. I'm not wrong. Four fifty. And, and what would you anticipate the cost of of a single family home in Blatchford? It would depend on so many variables. Cost of the land, the um, cost of the architectural, the cost of the um, building envelope type. Um, so I don't think it would be a fair guess. You know, if we're going to look at a skinny home in kind of an expensive neighborhood surrounding it, maybe that would be like 800. I don't know. But if we're looking at comparables in the market right now um, that don't have all of those same constraints, but might be comparable, um, look at Westmount, a brand new skinny kind of top, top level designs probably going for just under eight. Okay, I was just I was just trying to sort of make a comparison if there you know if it would be almost the double as it was for a townhouse. Okay, it, it, it's, a, it's a valid question. We we don't have the numbers off the top of us. Okay, and just offhand, anybody happen to know? Are people actually taking advantage of renting out those garden suites? Anecdotally, I've heard of one person who is a friend of yeah. mine. It's just an anecdote. Maybe okay. that was a question to administration. They may have better data. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Councilor Wright. Madam Clerk, uh, we I spoke with the folks who are registered to speak for uh, item 7.8, and they are willing to come back at 345. Are, are we able to make that time specific in the middle of this item, or we have to wait this, for this item to make that amend the agenda? If committee would like to make that time specific now, you can do so now okay. for clarity. Okay, Councillor Stevenson, can you move that? Sure, I'm happy to move that item 7.8 be heard at 3.45. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, please vote.
And we're just missing one vote. Oh, never mind. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. Okay, that is carried. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, now we go to Councillor Tang. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thanks uh, to everyone to come out and share your expertise and perspective on this. Um, yeah, I think there's lots of great questions already asked. I just want to, I guess, confirm a few things. Um, I guess first to Ms. Anderson, uh, for all those comparison neighborhoods, none of those other ones uh, have the very specific sustainability goal uh, as Blatchford that requires such, you know, heavy upfront uh, utility investment, right? That's correct, Blatchford's unique. Yeah, and, and even when I was kind of looking at that information in my mind, I'm like, how is this even that comparable when I feel like we're talking about two two separate categories of um, development. But maybe that's just sort of my non-expert view of um, this conversation. Um, and then I guess the other thing, just something that you have mentioned uh, in your opening uh, and in your letter around, you know, there are ways that we can find new pathways to, to the key outcomes to develop this neighborhood. Um, and you also said, you know, compromises are in order. So I just wanna better understand um, that do you feel that there is a way to compromise on some of the other outcomes, but still arrive at the same, in particular, that sustainability outcome? Or is all of that kind of needs to be back on the table? Because I'm just in my mind, you know, in the absence of REAC um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you're offering a way to work with administration. To me, one of the important first step is to arrive at this agreed upon outcomes that we're all trying to achieve. And I'm just wondering how far, how, how far away um, are the two parties uh, kind of in that agreement? And what does it take to arrive at, you know, agreed upon outcomes that we're trying to achieve? Thank you for that question. Maybe just to, to reiterate, we're not we're not asking here uh, today that the private sector uh, has the opportunity to, de to develop Latchford. Um, mm -hmm. The private sector has been asked for their expertise um, over the past decade and we've provided it. And we were also asked this summer. What I would say is if there is no change made, the outcome will not change either. So how much change do you wanna make? What outcomes do you wanna achieve? This is a vision that was put in place two mayors ago uh, three councils ago, and a lot has changed in the world. Um, right now, one of the most pressing issues in our country, which is a G7 nation, is that we have a structural housing shortage, and we have um, kids, basically, and families who can't ever hope to own a home. So that was not part of the, the mix here. Uh, and to, to Adel's point about the city is seeing a lot of great sustainability initiatives here, but one of them is not the financial sustainability for home buyers, and you are selling to the top 1%. So you might want to keep that in mind and just rethink about what goals you have and also, you know, asking the question about what it is that you want to achieve. I think any any refresh on the question about what it is that this council wants to achieve is fair ball. Uh, and then and then it's just how far, how fast, and it will be totally up to you. We're just here to provide advice. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and I think those are definitely pressing challenges you've mentioned. And I think, at least for myself, uh, you know, weighing that against also uh, know the pressing issue around, cl you know, climate change and, you know, the energy transition goals um, are, and that's happening globally as well as I think is is the other, uh, obviously, tension for, for me personally. But anyways, appreciate those feedback uh, and, uh, um, and appreciate all of you for coming out. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Sohi. So, uh, Ms. Anderson and Ms. Kaylin, uh, I really appreciate and your expertise and also Mr. Calden. Uh, I Can you help me understand better? Is there any change we could make in our business case goals and then to achieve the outcome we're talking about here. Uh, so I heard you talk about uh, the committee is not existing anymore. 
So is that the way and we re set up the committee and then could to help us to make some strategic change and then to achieve the goal and in more efficient or effective, cost effective way as well. Uh, so may, maybe you can help me understand and then I'm seeking, I'm seeking for some like information and a better understand and how we can do this better. And I think right now it's a time and for us to ask certain questions. Is there any change we want to implement at this moment? And what type of change we could implement? Well, uh, I would say that uh, Adel, on behalf of CHBA, did recommend that you could hire um, a professional review, external, um, you know, volunteer review as well, um, you know, has been provided, could be provided, but if you really want to dig into it, I think that you might want to have somebody to help you do that. And um, yeah, I don't know, Adel, if you wanted to add anything more onto what I just said there. Yeah, I would, I would go back to my recommendation. I think before figuring out the next steps of the strategy, one has to get a unbiased independent third party opinion of cost revenues and costs. And the, the information has to be put out there so that industry associations like ours, both UDI and CHB can go through the data and say, you know, thumbs up, we actually agree with the analysis. This is what it is. The independent external consultant can, you know, free of biases can come back and say, this is what it will take to do status quo this is what it'll take to do whatever the next vision looks like and as part of that next vision they can solicit input from industry through either an rfi process or even just a basic consultation and come back with what a feasible alternative would look like like it's there's no single point solution that would be easy like we've thought through and there's not just oh if you did this one thing it would all solve itself there isn't that solution okay Thank you, that's my question. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Thank you so much for being here. That concludes the questions from committee and council members. Now we will go to our administration for, uh, uh, for questions. And this was exempted by Councillor Stevenson and I'll start with her. Go ahead, Councillor Stevenson. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Well, I'll just uh, kick us off by putting uh, the recommendation on the floor that the October 12, 2022 Integrated Infrastructure Services Report, IIS 01335, be received for information. Um, but you, still lots to talk about. I, I really appreciate the information that was pulled together. Um, really like the switch to annual forecasting. I think that's that's a much more realistic approach and it, um, great to see that this, this business plan is actually intended to be much more adaptive moving forward. I do just want to explore um, this idea around sort of the rigid implementation of the plan. And I know that the report alludes to a prospect on 26 acres to the east um, of the site. And if this required adjustments to, to the plan, like the land use plan, I'm assuming that, that is something that we would be open to and that we would contemplate? Yes, we would definitely be open to changing the ARP as we go. Absolutely, okay, that's great to hear. So like other communities, we would um, you know, respond to those evolving conditions and opportunities that come up. That's great to hear. You know, I think- a, a In saying that, mm. I think what you heard from the speakers today is an adjustment on the basis of business case goals. We would need clear direction from council if there's a desire to adjust that. Okay, thank you. Yep, noted, I think. Uh, yeah, that's helpful. Um, affordability has come up, and I think it's a really important one. I mean, I think I think a critical part of the conversation is that there is the commitment to 16% affordable housing. Um, so that would be non-market housing in the community, which I think is, is very unique uh, to other developing communities. Is that correct? Yes, that's the, the city goal, and we're going to achieve it in Blatchford, 16% affordable housing. That's excellent. Um, but recognizing that, you know, there's the non-market, but we also want to think about market affordability as well. Um, just interested if if the team has been considering, because again, I, I, I think it's important to, to maintain uh, the, the density. I think um, being 100% multifamily is actually an incredibly exciting aspect of the development. But just wondering if we've explored other opportunities. So again, I think some of the multifamily um, you know, the taller four to six story buildings coming in are gonna offer some different price points. Just wondering if we've also explored some, some more 
radical ideas around potential subdivision of garden suites uh, that people could purchase potentially as a, as a first home, um, even second uh, gardens, secondary suites, or even looking at our lotting, like if smaller lots add for greater affordability for townhomes. Just, just wondering if the team's been considering those types of ideas. We, we've had multiple discussions with multiple builders about doing certain things. We, um, the current zone in state, the first stages uh, obviously follows what's approved. Moving forward, there's, I always say, there's the unwritten rule, <coughs> no single family homes in Blatchford because it's not written down. And if we can achieve the densities, I don't see why we wouldn't moving forward. Great, so that, that option is still there to introduce some different housing choices as long as it's meeting those requirements. That's fantastic. Um, you did note the, or the report notes that the idea of a cross-departmental team to advance the Blatchford applications, which I think is, is a really exciting opportunity, particularly if we extended that as an opportunity for any community that is achieving similar um, sustainability goals. Is that, is that a, something that would require additional resources or just a refocusing of existing resources in administration? Well, those, those teams would be outside of our purview, so it'd probably be... Uh a d different group that would respond to that, sure. but I Maybe would suggest... Ms. Petrin, uh, if, if you were able to weigh in on that. So just sort of a, an expedited permitting process for Blatchford and, and other neighborhoods that are also striving for that greater sustainability. Um, I think the challenge with that is just around uh, what gets prioritized and, you know, there's a lot of important areas where we need to focus our time in terms of resources, whether it's uh, uh, Blatchford, small businesses, affordable housing, industrial, etc. Um, so we do work um, really as an integrated team to support the applications through the permitting process and we've set service levels so that there's clarity on timeline expectations. Okay, great. I mean, I think that's an idea to continue exploring. Um, just wondering as well, you know, I think what's exciting for me for Blatchford is not only what happens on the site, but the ripple effects it can have. Uh, and just wondering if there may be opportunities, I may have a subsequent motion around this, but opportunities to expand um, some of the district energy to surrounding buildings? Yeah, we, we have, um, our, our team has been looking at that and we have uh, been in discussions with the major landholder in the neighborhood, uh, it continuing to review what what the energy needs are and what we can do with what we have there. Great, thank you so much and thanks for the great work on this. Thank you, Councillor Steele. Councillor Knack. Thanks, Mayor Sohi. Uh, th thanks for the information. So I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what the right way to solve, because like, I, I'm not, I don't want to see this obviously like thrown out and like stop doing what we're doing. Generally speaking, I like the direction, um, but I don't think exactly the direction we're going is, is perfectly helping us achieve our goals. So, so I worry that if, you know, the average home price, even with suites, is $650,000, you know, are we making this in, you know, uh, <laughs> is this gonna be an urbanist Glenora, essentially uh, a spot that no, but no regular person can afford to live in um, because we haven't expanded those options. So I'm wondering how to give, how to figure out how to have that conversation about giving you some flexibility. So I remember when Car the Councillor Cartmel first made the motion around this, he talked about even the price of land that we sell it at to builders. You know, we have a certain price to hit a certain target as, as uh, identified in this goal, but maybe we're okay with not making money, but instead breaking even, and by charging a lower price, we can create uh, lower price products that still achieves the other standards. So, so what I'm trying to figure out is, how do we allow you to have those conversations? Is that a, a bit of a review of the business case in partnership with industry stakeholders to figure out what some of those options might be to allow us to accomplish that? Again, not, not going to the extreme here, but just modifying this approach. I think first there has to be a, a, a more accurate reflection of pricing as it relates to the type of location we're in. Um, and I'd, I'd really like Tom to be able to provide that um, because there are numbers thrown around, but I think it's important to provide comparisons that sure. are reflective of where we're building in Blatchford. Well, and, and so I guess, uh, and I'd like that, but I think the worry is, is, is if we're comparing to other central neighborhoods and selling six hundred or $700,000 homes, then truly we aren't creating a situation where the average person could afford. I mean, I think about, you know, I have a family member and her partner that were originally planning on moving into Blatchford. They each work good full-time jobs. They can't afford to move here. 
uh, and they would like to. So, so if we're just creating comparable price product to what we would have in Glenora or what we would have in other mature neighborhoods, I, I'm worried that's missing the mark. Yeah, so I think if council, uh, based on the, the vision that has been set and the business model that has been set, is prepared to consider a different rate of return. Absolutely, yeah. Um, again, I think we would need to understand the limits that council is comfortable with that before we would pursue anything. I, um, yeah, I get you wouldn't want to, you would want direction for that. We would, I yeah, think we'd have to receive direction in order to be able to uh, undertake the work and prepare a business model that reflects those Because I, I think there's nothing wrong with having that conversation saying, hey, we still want to achieve the same environmental goals. We still generally want to accomplish the same density goals, but maybe we're willing to move on rate of return because if we get this build out as quickly as possible while achieving those other goals, there's a cost savings between somebody not moving to the outskirts and more homes getting sold. So there's an there's a, there's a indirect return to us that, that I know we couldn't necessarily build into a business case, but I think we would all generally understand. So, Yeah, and I think there's also a consideration going back to the vision of Blatchford that um, parameters around how you would move around the city, how you would make choices in terms of either energy or vehicles Absolutely. or your mode of transportation yeah. are very different in terms of what's being built in Blatchford. So Agree, and that um, there's a cost savings to that. Again, the problem is if I can't get the initial payment to buy that home and start reaping the benefits of not having to buy a car or not having to have the same energy costs, but if we can't get the average person there, then, then we're still, again, I feel like missing a, a big group of people who would like this opportunity, and, but but right now don't have that. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop and I'll allow sure. Tom to. Yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, uh, and I know you're working hard on this. I'm just trying, I wanna make sure you have the, the, the ability to look at that, so. I, I think one of the biggest challenges, the market, the market, brand new build in central Edmonton <clears throat> is gonna cost you a certain amount of money. If it's in Blatchford, if it's outside of Blatchford. One thing we've missed is in, in the first stage, we have a number of multi-sites. They haven't come to market yet meaning the builder hasn't put their, their parcels up for sale. And in fact, last week, the first multi-site was uh, starting to be constructed on. They're starting in the 465. These are townhomes on a multi-site. So it's, okay. yeah. we're gonna have a variety of product. We don't have them all on site yet, just like any new community. I remember one community I visited a long time ago, the grand opening was all the estate homes. So living in the suburbs in an estate home, that's gonna cost you a lot of money. It's now a great community full of a variety of housing types. Blatchford, the first thing we brought on, I won't call it estate homes, but it was the townhomes. It's the biggest thing you can live in in Blatchford today. Mm -hmm. We have four to six story buildings that are going to be built. We have uh, 12 to 15 mid-rise buildings that are gonna be built. So once we get all those housing types in there, uh, it's, it's gonna provide a variety of types and a variety of affordability. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, <clears throat> thank you, and, and thank you for your work on this. I think um, it, it's interesting as we talk about this m complex world of market housing. Um, I guess one thing that I, I know that Councillor Stevenson asked about affordable housing, and there's the 16%, but again, <laughs> and I feel like a broken record on this, 80% of market in Blatchford is going to be significantly higher than 80% of market in suburban areas by the pure nature of it. So that affordable housing could also be unaffordable for most based on our affordability um, report that showed that if it's over $1,100 or one, $1, per month, it's unaffordable. And so, and we know we have a, a housing affordability or we are going to be in short supply of affordable housing anyway, based on our current demand and the rate at which we're building. So all of this to, to be said, when I reviewed the, the business case from 2020, 2014, I felt like one area that it was really weak in was social sustainability goals. It talks about social sustainability in terms of like walkability or transportation and those kind of things but the actual like social fabric of our world has changed quite dramatically. And we've, we've put a lot more of an equity lens on things since then, for example. I guess 
that's where I'm seeing maybe a, a, an opportunity to continue down this track, but also look at this with fresh eyes is around that social sustainability dimension. What are your thoughts on that? And if it could use a, a bit of a refresh to modernize it to our current sort of thinking and, and ways of knowing. I, like I said, we're, we're open to changing and being nimble with this project. We've, we continually talk to people. We continually are doing things. We're looking at different ways of achieving the goal. Social sustainability as the developer is one of the things we ha can have a huge impact on. Uh, in, in our first stage, we've, we've built custom zoning so that the houses interact with the public space a little different. We actually, in stage one, have amenities that people can use and they, they do use. There's community gardens, there's a playground. People are already interacting within the community. Um, when we're done, there's going to be multiple commercial sites. But, but like you said, the next 20-ish years, there's going to be lots of variances from what we're doing today. Yeah, um, I, I think that that's where the, for me, the gap is right now that I'm seeing and the tension that I'm, that I'm seeing is, for example, even at the lower end of the 450, right? Like, cause I know I'm thinking, of, I, I was living in Inglewood. So that is a very direct comparable to Blatchford. I would say in terms of new builds, infill cost and, and Blatchford cost. And it's still in Blatchford about a hundred thousand more per unit for a single or a, or a sorry, a, a, a row house or a townhouse. But you say all, you've mentioned all of these great amenities that help, but are we not from an equity perspective, if, if it's still not affordable, is it not then those that can afford, that get the benefit of these amenities? So we're creating again, an, a, a, like I just, yeah, I, I guess I'm just really grappling with, with this. I, what would administration's thoughts be on a subsequent that talks about reviewing the business case regarding social sustainability goals, uh, environmental goals, and the rate of return with the intent to address affordability and report back in the new year? Would there, what, were, what would your thoughts be? Would you welcome that? Uh, I mean, we're here to do what you want us to do. Uh, it's, we've, we've finally reached a, a stage in Blatchford where we're starting to go. So to keep revisiting and revisiting, it's, well, it's, we are always looking at it. Uh, we kind of want to grab some traction while we have the opportunity at this point. But um, it doesn't feel iterative because even in this report, we're, refre we're referring back to a business case from 2019. As was mentioned, the ARP has never been adjusted. So that doesn't feel iterative to me. Can you comment on that? I, I will suggest the ARP is very vague. If you look at it in, on the internet, it's a pretty open document to begin with. Uh, and because we are at the beginning stages as we move forward, I, I, as Adam said, I worked in the private side for 12 years. It, an ASP and NSP is very descriptive. It tells you exactly what, what you can put, where you can put it. Blatchford, the ARP is a little more open. Uh, we will, we're definitely open to changing it if we need to. I'd just maybe add, uh, iteration comes in different forms. Um, all of this neighborhood is built out of our traditional design and construction standards guidelines, the blue book as it's been referred to. Um, there's been lots of iteration to come up with the, what you see out there today to fit the financial model that we have and continue to iterate so that it becomes more efficient and effective in terms of attracting those builders. So um, I wouldn't say it's policy iteration, uh, I would say it's iteration within the context of the vision and policy the council has provided. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. Uh, so by looking at our business co uh, case goals and then just based on the reports, it actually achieved a lot, most goals just also for the few. And then my question is, specifically right now so far since 2010 to now, what is the key challenge here for this project? And then because you mentioned about some direction you need at this moment, I really want to understand those key challenges, how we address them will determine the direction we are going and starting from today. So I really want to get the sense, the key challenge and for this project. So maybe I'll start. Uh, administration isn't seeking direction on this if council okay. is still satisfied with the vision for Blatchford. 
there's been sort of musings around um, um, c uh, additional considerations within the vision pricing uh, affordability. Um, I think we would need to understand that from council uh, as a whole, what, what desired changes would be considered based on the original business case goals. Uh, at this point in time, we're carrying out the vision that council has set. Um, this is a report that responds to a, a, a motion related to is there a, you know, an interest from private sector. What we heard from private sector is that if the goals aren't changing, there isn't. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes a policy discussion for council. Um, in terms of challenges, I think Tom can speak to some of those as it relates to the initial stages of Blatchford. Yeah, as, as Adam indicated, we, um, we custom designed all the roads. So, I mean, doing things out, outside of the norm has been a challenge and it's taken time to, to um, get to the, to the end goal of actually building and, and having people live there. So it's taken time. But as I mentioned in the first place, uh, seven years from an active airport to people living there, I don't know, is, is really a, a long time frame. I think, as I also mentioned, the original business plan was quite aggressive. Uh, I don't know that that was achievable. Obviously, we, we didn't achieve it, but uh, there's been there's been a variety of things that we've had to try to figure out as we move along because we're doing something different. Um, so specifically for the uh, for the goal, uh, I just uh, I want to respond to back to you, um, your the goal, and specifically we talk about uh, affordable housing, but the the already this 20% is already changed to 60, uh, 16%. So for that 16% right now is already underway. So we don't need to re review the policy and for that. So that his change is already, already and starting implemented, right? That is correct, it's a city policy okay. that we plan to So that, that's very good, we, we don't need that piece. Uh, and specifically for a larger piece, we talk about the prov provincial building code and for the water, like green water reuse. So that one's still underway and for us to look at that. And there is no direction for that piece. Yeah, we, we don't require direction. We originally yeah. when we started making our um, rules around building, uh, yeah. you, you weren't allowed to reuse gray water. That rule has changed. So we will continue to visit and figure out if we can implement it. Yes, yeah, so I heard you, uh, the concern if we revisit something, and then I, I, I think that is a good point. And because this project is already started since 2010 and many years past, and we already achieved the goal and for seven years to people to live in, from first to move in, and if we revisit and re do some like professional review, as how that impact could be, can you tell me a little bit more? And because I heard my colleague thinking about that. Yeah, like it, it's always a challenge. We have people who we, we've been telling what Blatchford's going to be like if that changes. Obviously people who have invested are builder partners, more importantly our homeowners that are living there. If the vision is going to change, then it, it will definitely throw a reputational risk as to where we're going. Okay, is that, is that a fair to say that this unique project is the only one project for city and then perform like as the developer? Is the only one our city is doing? The, the city is the developer of? Yeah, and perform as a developer for this, this is only one project we're doing. Well, we have folks from real estate here, but we are also primary landholder for exhibition lands and I don't know if we're primary landowner for Rossdale, but we're significant landowner for Rossdale and I don't know if BART is available. Okay, I think my, my time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, okay. Uh, I do have some questions. Uh, so if I understand correctly that the product that we're building there would be in the same price range beyond Blatchford in, in the surrounding areas or within the mature neighborhoods. So infill affordability is a bigger question than just a Blatchford issue. That is correct, yes. Okay, and the product that has been built so far is the, probably the, if I understood correctly, is probably the most expensive in Blatchford? 
That is correct. It's the biggest thing according to the current plans that you can buy in Blatchford. Okay. And how deep is your collaboration with the private sector? Uh, are we engaging with the private, are you engaging with the private sector on an ongoing basis to look at keeping the intent of the business case intact, density and, uh, and sustainability features, but I also look at what are the other areas that we can tap into their expertise to remove some of the barriers or maybe remove some of the cost drivers. How deep is your engagement with the private sector? It, it's not officially formalized, but it, I have had a number of conversations with different developers about Blatchford. We do build, as, as you know, the, the builders at Blatchford are part of the private industry. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're private companies that build the homes for the people. So what, what, would, why, what would it take to have that formalized? I absolutely support the business case. I don't think we should be revisiting that. Uh, absolutely, uh, but I think what can we do to kind of formalize that relationship in a way that you're able to continue to tap into private sector expertise to give you advice on uh, uh, on things that can be improved. So there's there's a couple things that currently happen. Um, we meet with UDI monthly as a senior leadership team. Tom is actually in those meetings. Okay. There's t by the nature of Tom's. Uh, sorry, Mr. Lumsden's experience, he's got strong relationships with the industry sector that, 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 that are in this space. Um, and there's also a strong connection to the, uh, apologies, I think it's the Community Energy Transition Advisory Committee. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are mechanisms that do that, but, or sorry, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Um, there are mechanisms that we use to do that, uh, but if, if committee or council would like to but formalize one. So these We're relationships are kind of ad hoc, but not formalized, right? There's a formal touch base with okay. the um, Energy Transition Climate Resilience Committee. Okay. Uh, again, Tom attends the, the monthly UDI meetings with industry, um, but if we wanted, and we did have early on the Blatchford Redevelopment Advisory Committee uh, that was established early days with Blatchford. If if committee or council was interested in reestablishing something like that, um, we would be open to that. Okay. Um, I, 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 will, I will definitely think about that and uh, maybe have a conversation. Um, I think what would be yeah. helpful for us, Mr. Mayor, is there were things raised today by the speakers that uh, suggested a, a, um, a slower pace uh, on the energy transition side or uh, a different pricing uh, for housing. Um, it's been raised about maybe there's an element within the business case or the vision around social. That would not be my intent. Those are things that we would need to be yes. clear with any advisory groups yep. that. Um, Absolutely, and I, I would not be supportive of revisiting the business case, right? But I think ongoing input and tapping into expertise in a formalized way is something that we should consider. Because uh, it may allow us to learn some of the things, experiences that might be applicable for other developments, such as, you know, exhibition lands or, uh, uh, or uh, you know, uh, other, other areas. Uh, so I just want, want you to think more about, about that. The, on the, I know the first phase was low or so far now, right? Now we're speak, kind of picking up speed, right? And what have we learned from what of the some of the things that led to some of the slow growth so far? I hear you that it's comparable to other developments, but what are, what are things that we have learned? Uh, well, I mentioned our custom custom design infrastructure. Uh, the approval process has gone much smoother with okay. the subsequent stages because the approving uh, agencies go through it quicker. They understand what we're trying to do. Some of our interaction with our builders we've learned from the first group. Okay. Uh, we've, we've amended and changed some of the way things we're doing with architecture and our green building code we're continuing to look at. Okay. The district energy is a learning. It's a brand new utility that's owned by the city. Uh, so we've, we're learning every day as, okay. we, as we go and making changes to accommodate. Okay. Thank you. I'm out of time and I'll go to Councillor Cutmel. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the report and the information today. Um, so I just want to kind of review what I understand our current state to be. So we, and we heard numbers thrown around. So we heard 
that right now today roughly uh, $700,000 for a town home in Blatchford. Um, and I, Mr. Lumsden, you said something about there being an offering coming forward that's in the 465 range. Is, was that a town home or is that a condominium? Is that in a? It's a, a town home on a multi-site, so it would be a condominium. Yeah, so condominium. a town home on a multi-site. Okay. And yeah. how big a unit is that? I think it was 1,500 square feet ish. And how many bedrooms? Do you know? I don't know the details. So I guess the reason I'm asking that is, is um, you know, there's the cost per unit, then there's what the unit is. Uh, and one of the things we heard a lot about yesterday when we talked about, you know, the need for affordable housing right across the city, and admittedly this is, you know, there, that was a, a different conversation but a related conversation, uh, is the need for uh, family homes that are three plus bedrooms. So is there very much of that kind of product coming on in Blatchford? I just got a message, there's three bedrooms, the four, Those ones? The 465, okay. yes. And are they being built or they're being contemplated? The, I, like, this is the one I was referring to, I was out there last week watching them dig, dig okay. the hole, okay. so they're being built. Do we know when a school is going to be built? Uh, and are those sites part of the first phase or the first phases? We have a school site adjacent to stage two, it's a Catholic site. Um, when the schools are going to be built is of course up to the school boards. Uh, we have another site on the west or the east side of Blatchford that's a public school site. And again, it would be up to the school boards as to when a school will actually be built. And again, like just trying to, you know, see when we might see more families move into the to the neighborhood. Um, and then certainly back then to the form of, of building, you suggest or you said that there's 12 and 15 story buildings being contemplated. I'm assuming those are condo type buildings. Uh, we, we would sell the parcel and the builder would decide. So right now, uh, I think everybody's familiar, the condo market is pretty soft. So yeah. most of these uh, things being built or buildings being built are, are typically rental. Uh, these townhomes I'm talking about though are for sale. And how many are in that complex? Uh, that one is 15 on the first parcel. And subsequent parcels? Uh, the, we don't have the design for the second one they're planning to build on, but it'll be likely more because there's uh, a more allowance for height on the second parcel. So when this building is built, we'll have 149 townhomes at price points in that six to $700,000 range apparently, and the 15 at that 465 range. Well, I've, we, we've done some research over the last week. Uh, the townhomes, you're referring to the ones with basement suites and maybe garage suites that are the seven to 800,000. The starting price has ranged from 499, 520 to 569 okay. for those other ones. So better information on that as well. Um, okay, I think, there's a, I think there's a subsequent com motion conversation in the works. I'm, um, I guess my last question then is, will there be a, a comprehensive market uh, examination uh, undertaken soon. I don't know when the last one was, uh, but it would reflect what the demands are versus what the offerings are in Blatchford. Yeah, we, we had a formalized one done a couple of years ago and we will continue to do that because that's part of our business, of course, is making sure we're building uh, as the market is there and, and adjusting and accommodating to it. Well, I think the report speaks to uh, more frequent updates of, of progress, business plan progress, will we get updates on the market research as that is updated? That would be part of our targeting. So the, the, what we're suggesting is we'd come annually with a new vision as to what's going to happen the following year and, and moving forward. And when would be the first time we would see that? Uh, well, this I would suggest right now the the numbers in this report are based on what we think is going to happen next year, so probably next year would be the beginning of that. Uh, last question then, ARP amendments are usually uh, brought forward by the owner um, of the property. So if we're talking about ARP um, amendments that might contemplate single family ho housing, you know, s uh, skinnies and duplexes for instance, that would have to be brought forward by the city to the city. Is, is the city contemplating that or is that going to require a motion to compel that? We, we would do that as part of our business. We, we act as the owner, even though I work for the city, we, we act as the same as a private developer. I, I bring rezonings to council to get approved as the owner. Councillor Cartmel, we have other situations like that where someone through administration, whether it's real estate or the Blatchford office, make amendments and then 
um, through my team, we are the regulator. Yeah, no, I understand the process. I'm just wondering if anything's coming. We have no, I'm out of time. We have no plans right now. <laughs> thank so you, you need a motion. <laughs> Thank you, Council Salvador. Yeah, thank you, Marisohi. Um, mm, a lot of my questions have been answered, but I did wanna just ask a few about uh, the scenarios that were proposed in attachment four. Um, so just seeking some clarity, because both of the scenarios, as I understand them, propose the same number of hectares sold per year. Uh, so A, sort of business as usual, six hectares per year, and then B would be six hectares, but sort of split between three, three for us, three for them. Um, wondering why there weren't some sort of alternative scenarios contemplated where we're doing more than, than six hectares per year, private or otherwise? At this point, that's what we believe the market uptake could be. It, it wouldn't matter who was building it. There's still only so many people that want to buy houses in, in certain areas. So that's where that's why the contemplation was. It would either be us doing the development or us in the private sector doing kind of alternating. Okay, okay. And yeah, I guess hearing, hearing from our speakers around just the challenges with absorption, um, yeah, I guess they, they feel similarly unless uh, criteria and standards and our approach was changed. So, okay, that makes sense to me then. Um, wanted to ask as well, just about the opportunities for faster realization of development, opportunity two, I asked this to one of our speakers, but um, the ability to bring larger sections of land to market for larger home builders. Uh, can, you, can you talk to me a little bit about that? I, I'm just curious how far we've gone in, in considering that as an opportunity. We, we've had discussions with, like, like I said, with multiple home builders. Some of them are large, some of them are small. Uh, some of them we've suggested this. We've talked about, would you like to buy a whole stage is what I'm going to call it. Is there interest in that? There, there has been positive feedback. We, we have to work through the details as to how we get to the end of that. Um, but I, again, the uptake on the market is kind of the limiting factor here. Okay. Um, yeah, and then just going back to, to absorption, so a lot of speakers, of course, pointed to that. Um, seeing, seeing housing mix as a barrier. Uh, I guess what I'm, what I'm hearing through this conversation is that the townhomes that are currently in place are sort of that upper end, um, but there are still gonna be opportunities for, for alternatives. There are gonna be lower price points. Um, you just gave the example of, I think it was 465 for uh, 1500 square foot, three bedroom townhome. Um, that's where we're headed, right? Yeah, like you said, the, the, the first offering in Blatchard is the biggest thing you can buy. We are we have parcels in the first stages that are four to six story. One maximum density is 182 units. So when that's built, um, there'll obviously be a different price point on those. Okay, so we wouldn't be expecting apartments that, are, that would be coming online to have that similar sort of high, high initial upfront cost? No, no. Okay. No. okay. Um, and then just a question on district energy as well. So, yeah, in the legal implications section, I, I'm trying to understand if we were to allow for more private development, we would not be able to require them to connect into district energy, would we, or would we? Uh, we, we, we would. There's a bylaw in place that you have to hook into the district energy unless you can prove you're uh, carbon neutral on your own. So. Uh, anybody who builds in Blatchford, whether it's through me or a private developer, yeah. would have to hook up to the district energy system. Okay, okay. Yeah, and obviously, you know, maintaining uh, high green building standards and energy efficiency is, is very important to, uh, to achieving our goals. I, I'm also wondering, since we, we can sort of measure and, and determine the operating cost reductions associated with some of those those green building standards. Do we know how much value that's actually adding to to the homes in Blatchford? Um, I don't have an exact number, but obviously it's, it's um, well, the UDI and representatives indicated it's not something people are willing to pay for at this point, but ultimately with the world changing and the, the rules changing, it's obviously going to be something that's attractive as yeah. we move forward. Yeah, and eventually, I mean, getting to a place where there are higher standards across the board and that playing field is, is leveled, I think that's part of the conversation as well. Um, that is a really good flag that I think is a takeaway for us to see if we can quantify. And I, I think that helps in terms of market as well. Yeah. 
Excellent. Okay, I think um, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. Um, do, do you have an idea um, about the uptake in people taking advantage of, of rental, sorry, the, the garden suites or basement suites rentals? I don't have exact numbers. Obviously, the homeowners are in the homes. I, we haven't asked all of them, but I, I do know of some. Councillor Stevenson indicated she knows somebody who's living in one. I know a home that has a basement, garage suite, main suite, and there's three different people or groups living in those three different suites. Okay. Out of how many? Well, it's, it's the only one I, that I okay. know of specifically because so. I've interacted with that group. Oh, okay. And then I'm just wondering, um, just uh, there was... Uh, in, in one of the pages, the reports, um, it talks about the, the, the property for Nate um, for servicing to be completed by 2023. Yeah, that's our that's our target. Uh, we're we're actually grading that land right now. Okay. And just then see. next year, as soon as the frost is out of the ground, we'll start putting underground in, with the intention of having surface done by the end of next construction season. Okay. Um, and then also on attachment four, where it talks about the property taxes, or really doesn't talk about the property taxes, um, I guess what, what, would be the, what would be the difference between like a four or six story multifamily unit um, as opposed to single family? The, what, what, we, what I've learned is the nominal tax rate is about 0.07%. So whatever the, the value of the property is, that's the money you're going to make. So that's why, like you said, it doesn't really speak to it. The difference between the city being the developer and selling these six six hectare parcels um, to private is they would start to pay uh, taxes on the, the parcel right away, but then the turn into the final homeowner, whether I do it or they do it, uh, will result in the same net tax. So the comparison that you're asking, I, I don't know the actual, but it's point, like I said, 0.07% of uh, the value of the property is what the nominal tax rate is. But if we get a couple hundred units in it, maybe $300,000 a unit for a, a condo versus on that same parcel of land, I don't know, maybe four or six houses at 700,000, to me the math would work that, it, that a multi-unit multi, multi -unit yeah, we we didn't yeah we didn't go down the path of uh, contemplating single family homes in this business model that that was never the the intent we had the same same model same the motion literally states density uh, green building initiatives all those still have to be achieved so our comparison for the tax kind of calculation was selling it to a, some to a private developer they pay tax on that raw land until they put people in the houses and then the uptake. But their, their model would have to follow our, like they would still have to build the multifamily. They'd still have to achieve the densities. Okay. So that would require, uh, to my earlier comment, a, a direction from council uh, related to the change in density. Although, as Tom has mentioned, um, you know, if we can achieve the density and go to single family uh, in, in areas, uh, that'll be something we'll evaluate. But it's not a, if it were to be a blanket, turn this to single family, we'd need direction from council. Uh, what if we were to provide the land to some of our housing providers to build that affordable housing? We're actually working with the affordable housing group in the city. Um, we have a parcel in stage two that we're offering up for that. So it's going through a competitive process to f find somebody to build on it. Okay. okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Before I go to Councillor Tang, uh, just want to give a heads up that I will be making a subsequent motion related to the question that I asked about formalizing that relationship with the UDI and the energy transition. A group of clerk could help with some of the wording, uh, working with Adam, uh, and I would like that for committee to consider. Uh, Councillor Tang, next. Great, thank you very much, and thank you very much for this uh, pretty comprehensive report. Um, just so I'm like really clear, um, the timeline for the 20 to 25 year full build out, um, like that includes the central park, the town center vision, right? And this would be inclusive of basically from when the business case was approved. And just wondering if that number is still accurate, uh, given kind of the challenges in the market, supply chain and all of that. It's, it's our, it's our, 
it's what we're saying is achievable today. Uh, obviously, like you said, the market dictates as to how quickly things will yeah. be bought. Um, if there's a big okay. boom in Edmonton, which we're hoping there is, that things might go faster. Obviously, if things struggle, it'll be slower. But the, yeah. um, the actual, so the business plan contemplates me selling raw land to a builder. That's, that's the dates that are in there. The actual okay. building of the building and occupancy is up to the builder once we've turned it over to them. The, the, the finishing up on the Central Park and all the amenities within would be in that kind of time frame. Okay, great. Um, and then, you know, just looking at that second scenario, um, just, you know, hypothetically, uh, you know, if, 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 if you were, if you're contemplating selling the land, like when would that even occur? Like as soon as possible or like, um, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, not that I, this is my preferred scenario, but I was just curious about uh, sort of timeline. We, well, I think the, the, the scenario we proposed in, anticipates we would start that process immediately. Like we'd have to subdivide off a parcel of land, which still takes time. We'd have to go through certain approval process to, to decide right. which ones we want to yeah. sell off if that was the case. And, and also, I mean, obviously it will require some of the revisiting of those schools, which um, I think are actually quite important for this project. Um, and then also just, you know, there's a lot of community amenities. So, so we're under this scenario, would you also envision some of this money be recovered through community amenity requirements by, by private developers on, on some of those parcels? Is that part of the model? The, the model doesn't contemplate, the model contemplates that we still continue okay. to do all the amenities, the storm ponds and the central park, okay. as you mentioned. Some of the local amenities to the to the builder, whatever, or the developer, if they buy, maybe they would be responsible for. They'd be responsible for the local roads and whatnot to connect into the main. Uh, and, main. and then just a, just a quick follow up on that school question earlier. Um, so, I mean, obviously it is school board and the province funding, but we have no inkling whether or not they were approved like this last round um, by the province, right? Or if they're even on the on the priority list by the school board? I, I don't know okay. where, where they're okay. at with that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then I was interested in some of the opportunities highlighted um, just in terms of continuous improvement and uh, advancing the development, but just wondering for that opportunity for, um, you know, what would bring additional staff in look like and in, look like and how much would it cost or have, have, have you guys done that number crunching and how, I guess, how is the current number of staff like limiting the pace of development? Uh, the, it, we, we haven't gone into detail as to okay. what it would look like to grow our team much bigger. We're currently uh, growing a little bit as, as we speak. So as, as the community grows, we're gonna continue to review resources and see where we're at. Uh, as mm -hmm. to how we can achieve the goals okay. in a timely fashion. But the current number of staffing is, you is just, you feel not enough resource to keep, you know, speed things up. Yeah, to, to speed things up, I guess that would be a, a good way to put it. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. potent, a potential way to do it is to add, add more people. Doesn't, doesn't specifically mean that's what we do, but it is right. an option that we could review. Right, right, right. Um, and then that opportunity three for that cross departmental internal team, like it sounds like a like a special task force almost. Um, would you like for that opportunity? You know, would it cause issues with other developers or other development projects having like a dedicated special flash for task force? Having having spent uh, over a decade in the private side and having lots of friends in the industry, I would suggest yes. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I think those are all my outstanding questions. I really appreciate the answers and um, uh, and I look forward to hearing some of the subsequents. Thank you, Councillor Tang. Uh, just before I go to Councillor Rice, from agenda management point of view, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Principe has uh, 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 some uh, important uh, uh, engagement to attend, right? Uh, and she won't be able to come back after 1.30. And uh, the, 
Evansdale surplus school site is in her ward and she has some questions. So what I would suggest that once we have concluded questions with the, this item and we have accepted for information, voted on it, then we hold off on subsequent motions uh, before we, uh, so we can complete uh, uh, 7.4. Okay, uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, just one last quick question. So if we pass this just received for information, and for these two scenarios, and we still implement two of them, and then or we just uh, still keep as a uh, current development model. No, we would just carry on as the current development model. Just to carry on for that. Yes. And then with uh, some actions, opportunities, and the last outline is a report. There's four opportunities, so we still carry on for that. That's correct. That's the iteration I think that Tom is referring to around improving our approach to delivering. Okay, so then subsequent motion will be just uh, based on the carrying on and then add the extra uh, improvement or pieces. Yeah, what I heard is a potential subsequent the mayor alluded to around uh, formalizing an advisory um, committee or we're working on the language right now. Um, that that's what I heard. If there's different direction that committee would like to provide related to Blatchford, um, um, that would be um, something that council would okay. have to decide. Okay, that's my question. Back to you, Mayor. Sorry. Thank you, Councilor Ray. So we uh, that concludes the questions. We have a motion on the floor to receive for information. And are we ready to vote? Okay, please. Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, please sign up. Councillor Nack? Yeah, sorry, and, and I know you said we'll, we'll do subsequent after, but I just want yeah. to make it very clear that I'm actually very interested in discussing Councillor um, Rutherford, is her name, uh, <laughs> uh, subsequent. Uh, yeah. Just, I, I, so I, I, I will vote to receive this information, yeah. but with a clear understanding that I want to debate that as well. And oh, so, sorry, absolutely. Yeah, so that's fine. I, I, for the sake of time, I just want to make sure, especially in men folks, know that I'm ready to have that discussion. Good. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. All right, please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried, and we'll come back to subsequent uh, motions later. Uh, do we need to bring forward uh, 7.4, Madam Clerk? Yes, if you could move uh, a motion. Councillor Nack, can you put Councillor Rice, please yep. move? Yeah. So move. Okay, please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we are on to 7.4, Evansdale Surplus School Site. Uh, please, is there a presentation from administration? There are some quick opening remarks. Please do, go ahead. Good morning, Mayor Sohi and members of council. Uh, with me today is Chris Thiessen, our Director of Property Transactions, and Neil Ozaduk, our Director of Land Development, who's online to answer questions. We are here today to provide an update to committee on the public offering process for the Evansdale Surplus School Site which took place between April and May of this year and resulted in the selection of the Muslim Association of Canada as the selected applicant. School sites are administered under the joint use agreement, which governs how the city assembles property for future uh, school development and guides the process for school boards to identify whether or not a site is surplus to their needs. The boards that are part of the JUA include the Edmonton Public School Board, the Edmonton Catholic School Board, and the Conseil Scolaire Centre Nord. The city can acquire surplus school sites after they are declared surplus by the school boards and then decide how to use the land. In some instances, the city, uh, pardon me, in some instances, the city has acquired surplus school sites to maintain for open space, whereas in other situations, we have used surplus school sites for affordable housing initiatives, such as the first place program or the building housing choices program. Through an internal circulation, the Evansdale surplus school site was determined to be surplus to municipal needs 
Administration then took additional steps to relocate the site uh, within, its, within the overall park space to reduce the impacts to public playing fields, improve traffic circulation, and reduce anticipated development costs prior to listing the land for sale. When reviewing applications, administration looks at criteria such as the value of the offer, the conditions of sale that are requested, the proposed development timelines as well. The selected proponent, the Muslim Association of Canada, intends to build a school and community center to, su to support the growing community that they serve. Through the open public, open public offering process, uh, there had been at least a number, sorry, through the open public offering, their offer had at least a number of, had the least number of sale conditions and the best monetary return to the city. My apologies. Should council receive the report for information, administration will enter into the agreement with the Muslim Association of Canada. Once the transaction closes, net proceeds of sale will be credited to the funds in lieu reserve account and dispersed in line with city policy C468A. Thank you, and we would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, before I go to administration, do council members or committee members have any questions to uh, Issam Saleh from Muslim Association of Canada. You do? Okay. Sam, if you could please step up and grab a chair. Anywhere there? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Rice, do you have questions to Issam? Okay. No, uh, Councillor Prince Bay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hello, Mr. Saleh. Uh, I do have some questions about um, the school. What grades uh, are you anticipating? the school to have? Uh, from uh, preschool to grade nine, and if uh, the space allows it, we might add uh, high school. Okay. But uh, the way we're looking at it right now is from preschool to junior high and adding a community center to it as well. Okay, thank you. And um, why is this site ideal for you? Well, it's, it's in the heart of our uh, our community. Uh, we currently have a school by uh, Westmount and about 70% of our students come from the north side. So it's really the heart of our community there. Okay, great. And uh, with the development, so in that entire area, are you planning on having any green space there? Or will it all be developed? No, definitely there will be uh, two spots for a green space. We will be having covered patios uh, that will connect to the seniors uh, area that we will be adding into the uh, into the school. Okay, so there will be some green space remaining, yes. Yes. and will it be uh, will will there be public access to that green space? Yes, for sure. Okay, great. And are you, uh, last question: Are you willing to work with the community league? to have their input and I'd be willing more than happy to uh, facilitate that and be a partner in that as well. Definitely, definitely. We've been working with about on this site for the past six years and we've extended our hands and we will continue to extend our hands to Edmonton Public and the Community League and the community around it. Okay, great. Thank you. Those were the only questions I had. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Prince. Councillor Stevenson. Just very briefly, want to say thank you so much. I'm very excited for this and appreciate you coming forward today. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Chandra. Thank you for being here and uh, all the work that you do beyond the school into the community, right? So I uh, appreciate that. Thank you. It was fun to see the kids on Reading Read and Week. Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So that concludes the questions to Mr. Saleh. Then... Uh, now, questions to administration. Councillor Rice, you have questions to administration. You exempt to this? If I may, I would Go like ahead, you please. to put the motion on the yeah, floor yeah. and then move this, uh, move this and then receive as information, as recommended. Uh, there's a recommendation to yeah. be moved, right? Yeah. Can you read into the record, please? Part one and part two. Uh, sure, Mayor Sohi. Okay, I have a wording. Uh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Uh, I move the, that the October 12, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01432, uh, be received for the information. 
the attachment to of the October 12, 2022 Financial and Corporate Services Report, FCS 01432, remaining private pursuit to Section 16 and Section 24 and 25 uh, of the Freedom of Information and Production of the Private Act. Thank you, Councillor Reis. Uh, Councillor Principe, go ahead, questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So my first question is, uh, in the report it said not needed for municipal use, including open space and housing. The housing I understand because it is, you know, quite dense uh, in, in population. Um, how is it determined that there is not a need for open space? What are the metrics for that? I will pass that over to Neil Ozaduk who can help answer that question, but generally speaking, our open space uh, and parks team will review the amount of acres within a specific neighborhood and then determine whether or not that's sufficient for the density. But Neil, if you can add anything else to that, I would appreciate that. Yeah, that's, that's basically the approach. So they look at how much areas, uh, acres there are per, um, per resident. So I think it looks at, uh, I think their threshold is two acres per per resident per thousand residents, um, and this community exceeds that threshold. So there's not a need to keep it for open space. So what I heard is that it exceeds the amount of um, ideal green space. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And then uh, my second question, the development of the land, so the water, sewer, all of that, is that a, an expense of the city? No, of the developer. I'm just writing this down, sorry. <laughs> and uh, next question, a traffic study. Where, will there be a traffic study done? I know there are some concerns of the community league and residents of the possible uh, traffic issues? Um, Councillor, when we looked at subdividing the site, we looked at all the servicing and the uh, transportation impacts and everything, and the site was designed for a school site, so the use, the proposed use is consistent with that, so it, it likely isn't required. Um, but as part of our subdivision process and our, our, our due diligence in evaluating the site, we did notice that there was some potential access issues with the former location, which was on the, the bend of the road. So we did take that into account and shifted the site to the west to improve um, traffic and, and uh, yeah, to improve the traffic within the neighborhood. So unless they, they have to do a rezoning or they intend to do a rezoning for um, a different use, there wouldn't be a need to do another traffic study going forward, I don't believe. Okay, and that was actually my next question. That was a, a concern brought up to the community or by the community league is that uh, is it possible for someone to buy the property and then um, change their mind and say, now we're not building a school? Would it have to be rezoned then? If the proposed use was inconsistent with the existing zoning, so it didn't align with the US zoning, then yeah, they would have to come for a rezoning. So if somebody wanted to come in and changes to uh, residential development, they would have to come to council for a rezoning. Okay, great. And um, in attachment three, the conditions deferred servicing agreement, what kind of, is that standard agreement? The, the deferred servicing agreement, yeah, it's a, it's a standard city deferred servicing agreement. Um, typically, if you're doing a, a development, you'll be, um, required to sign just a servicing agreement, not a deferred one, but because we are subdividing um, this land for the purpose of sale, it makes sense that we do a deferred servicing agreement that's uh, connected with further development of the site. And that way it puts the cost and onus of doing all the development conditions on the purchaser rather than the city. Just to add one comment to your previous uh, question as well. In this instance, the, the buyer is also uh, committed to a development commencement date uh, as well as a buyback option for this city. So they have every intention to develop as a school and they've committed to a set timeline that, which can be found in attachment three as well. Okay, and uh, when this um, neighborhood was developed, this area 
that we're speaking of was initially intended to be a school site. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so we're just following through with what the initial intention was with Yes, so this, this. the school board's declared that are at least part of the joint use agreement. They've declared that the site is surplus to their requirements, but through the public offering process and when we went through uh, to see what different bids could come in uh, broadly, uh, the school uh, development was the one that was the most successful. So that's what we would see occurring here. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Principe. Uh, that concludes the questions. Uh, uh, now we, we have a motion on the floor. Are we ready to vote? Ready to vote? Okay, please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Okay, we are back to item 7.1 with the subsequent motions. All right, who wants to go first? Uh, okay, so, okay, is wording ready for my subsequent? Yes, just one moment, I will get that to you. Uh, let's do uh, Constable Stevenson's first, okay. Constable Stevenson, go ahead first. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'd like to move that administration prepare an unfunded service package for the 2023-2026 budget deliberations for the city to undertake a feasibility study to expand the Blatchford Renewable Energy Utility to areas adjacent to Blatchford outside the current service area, including but not limited to Hangar 14. Um, and as a quick preamble to that, uh, we know that um, regardless of whether the city is the owner or someone else is an owner, if the museum is there or not there in the future, Hangar 14 is going to be with us um, for a very long time as a, as a provincially designated uh, heritage resource. Um, bringing the renewable energy to this building uh, will help the overall sustainability of that building and I hope um, support efforts to keep the museum uh, in place, which is an outcome I'd really, really like to see. Um, the, the physical infrastructure for the renewable energy is basically at the doorstep of the museum. Um, this would just be completing the studies to do, uh, understand what the implications are for, for heat load. I hope it makes the utility more sustainable and feasible. There's also the opportunity to explore uh, expanding to other commercial properties in the area, which may um, help with some of the, the balancing in terms of having commercial and residential um, loads, um, being able to balance each other out in terms of peak demand times, uh, and with the university, uh, sorry, with Nate there as well. Okay, thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Uh, Councillor Cartmel, questions? Yep, thank you, just very quickly. Uh, do we know that the hangar is gonna be with us for a very, very long time? Is that, is that for sure? Not us as an organization, but the world. It's provincially designated, I guess I would say. Does that prevent its demise? In every, I mean, excuse my lack of knowledge here, but is that? Yeah, I think yeah. the I think the direction, Adam, I think the direction we gave on Hangar 14 was to divest from it within the next two years, right? Yes. Correct. Yeah. Option one is uh, through a uh, an opportunity to find someone that would maintain the existing use, yeah. and if after a year we're not able to achieve that, then pursue a, a different approach or uh, opportunity. That was the direction we received from council. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Salvador? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for this. Just wanted to, I guess, get, to get a better understanding of, um, of when we're gonna get a, a look at our citywide district energy strategy. Um, obviously, you know, this is, this is specific to the expansion of Blatchford's um, uh, energy utility, but yeah, is that work coming forward or is there gonna be something at budget that would be an ask associated with that? I apologize. Um. <laughs> working on a motion here but <laughs> no problem so i was just getting seeking some clarity around when the citywide district energy strategy would be at our fingertips 
Oh, uh, in terms of... Because I recognize this is just specific to Blatchford, um, but I'm, I'm yeah. also interested in that larger, larger yeah. strategy. just want to make so sure that's... My understanding is that's included as a unfunded consideration um, as part of the 23 to 26 um, as well, or it's identified within one of the unfunded service packages. Um, and again, during budget, council can choose to bring forward... Um, service packages for consideration. So uh, I believe it's linked into the uh, uh, ongoing energy transition strategy work that we have underway. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Councilor Silver. Councilor Rice. <clears throat> uh, two quick questions. The first question is about uh, what is time nine for this? Uh, it would come back at the fall budget. And then if we approve it, uh, administration may be able to speak about when, when that work would happen. And then is this time timeline and enough and for an administration to give the um, funding the package back? To prepare it for council's consideration? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I asked this question last time. I still didn't get the information yet. How many unfunding the service package so far right now? And then I am really concerned about so we have so many unfunding service packages and then uh, do we have enough time even to go through all of them and during budget deliberation? <laughs> That's a very good question. You would have to I, don't have, yeah. I don't have a number for total unfunded service packages. I can get you the number that you have requested, that council's requested be in the budget, um, but we're still in the process of determining which and ones will be in the budget or not for the administrative ones. Uh, so I'm not asking the information for which one should be included, should one not include. Sorry, I'm which ones should yeah. even make the budget binder as a service package? Okay, is that, do I need to make the council inquiry to do that? No? So we don't need to do that? I can, I can give you the number of motions for service packages that council has determined. I cannot give you the full number of council plus administration because we have not landed the number for administration. Okay, that's fair enough. I will follow up and offline and not take time from here. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wright. Councillor Prince, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the feasibility study, could there be any um, provincial or federal, because it is about with in relation to climate change, could there be any contribution from them possibly? Uh, typically, we, we have a challenge I would say whether it be this initiative or others getting funding for feasibility studies it's more of the implementation uh, associated with that so I think it probably is a bit challenging but we're always beating the bushes to to see if we can find opportunities for others to support us right yeah I thought just because it was in relation to climate change that maybe that was a possibility that that was it for me thanks, thanks. Yeah. thank you Councillor uh, Principal Councillor Paquette Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm just wondering, was this, uh, to extend it outside of Blatchford, was this contemplated before? Yeah, yes, it has been contemplated before. Okay, and, and what was the uh, result of that contemplation? Uh, it, it's an ongoing process, so we've, we've talked to some landowners. We're actually in discussion with uh, a fairly large landholder that's adjacent, then we're figuring out the logistics, if it can work or not. Okay, so it's uh, already the determination of administration that uh, this kind of expansion uh, would be possible, that, uh, that that load could be carried? Uh, as the opportunities present it, I think the difference here with this subsequent is we're getting specific direction on a on a particular facility that's identified, uh, but to expand it uh, beyond current plans on the basis of developing Blatchford as a boundary, so to speak. So it's opportunity-based, Councillor Paquette, versus receiving specific direction to do it here. Mm, I see. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume that this motion doesn't actually take a lot of work, that you have that information already and it would just be a matter of just sort of uh, 
taking a quick look at it and seeing if uh, these things were feasible? Uh, no. Uh, so to break it up, Councillor Paquette, to prepare the unfunded service package, yes. To complete the feasibility study, no, it does require work, which is why it would be a unfunded service package. Right. Huh. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Paquette. Just a quick question. I just want a certainty that this motion does not in any way alter the direction that we gave earlier on on the hangar, right? It does not. Okay, got it. Just need that certainty. Okay, good. All right. So please, we are ready to vote. Uh, please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. And we have time specific at 1.30, which is 9.2. Once we conclude that, we will uh, uh, come back on the rest of the subsequent motions on this item. Would you like me to move? Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Rutherford, can you do it? Yeah, please? I'd like to move that we move into private when, upon return. Uh, subject to Section 17 and 24 of the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Thank you. Please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. We'll be back at 1.30. Until then, we are on a recess.
I'll lock the doors, Madam Clerk. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are back in public. And the Councillor Stevenson. I guess, Mr. Mayor, I would um, like to move the attachments one and four of the October 12, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 01435 be revised as per the discussion. And that the GEF Seniors Housing Board candidate shortlist as set out in revised attachment one of the October 12, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 01435 be approved. And uh, that the draft interview questions as set out in revised attachment four of the October 12, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 01435 be approved. And that the October 12, 2022 Office of the City Clerk Report OCC 01435 remain private pursuant to section 17 and 24 of the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Are we ready to vote? Please vote. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried, and we're back to our uh, item 7.1 with subsequent mo uh, motions. And we already dealt with Councillor Stevenson's. Councillor Rutherford, do you have yours ready? Or Councillor Mack. Councillor Mack, good. Or if not, then I can go to uh, my subsequent. I've, I've sent it over, but whichever, if you want to do yours first, that's fine. Sure. Uh, can't. Whichever, yeah, whichever you have ready to go right away. So please uh, put it on the screen. That is yours. There it is. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the administration provide a report to committee on the following. Number one, review the Blatcher business case goals in regards to social sustainability, environmental goals, and the rate of return with the intent to address market affordability. Number two, undertake a comprehensive housing market review to include market demand by built form unit size and other major variables, uh, example garage, yard, school, proximity, et cetera, due date June 2023. And uh, just as a brief introduction uh, going in reverse, uh, point two, and, and we'll get clarification during questions, but my understanding is that uh, the city does do a market review on a semi-regular basis. Um, this just uh, documents it and we'll bring it back as part of the other body of work. And then the first part is actually uh, what Councilor Rutherford had uh, originally mentioned um, uh, in her questions, but uh, for me why some of that work is important is just to see, particularly I'm going to focus on rate of return, that, that one's of greatest interest to me. Um, I'd like to see if we aren't as worried about the City of Edmonton's rate of return uh, how much more affordable can those units be? And 
let's, or maybe not. I don't know what the answer will be. Um, and, and while I'll be honest, I'm very hesitant about the environment changing any type of environmental goal. I, part of me doesn't even like wording it in that motion, but for the sake of information and getting our best information, uh, I'm willing to include it in the motion. But my personal preference would be not actually seeing us change that. I would really be most inclined to look at the rate of return as the way to uh, consider what is the most affordable uh, way we can provide that. Great. Thank you, Councillor Neck. Uh, Councillor Stevenson. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Maybe, maybe just first to administration. So recognizing, you know, Councillor Neck's intent to not necessarily lead to changes in the environmental goals. I, I worry that this wording as it stands could send a signal that builders who are there now, who are building to, to the ambitious and achievable goals that we've set out, um, if this causes them to hesitate or causes them to pause in terms of doing that additional uh, building environmental work. Any thoughts on that for Mr. Lumsden or Mr. Lachlan? Well, I think I, I would say, which I'm, I'm not suggesting council don't have these discussions, but every time we talk about Blatchford and wondering about the direction of it and the business case, et cetera, it will always raise that flag. But that's part of delivering a project through a public sector model. Uh, no private development industries will uh, have this form of discussion this publicly. So yeah. it's just the nature of, of the environment that we're in. Yeah. Um, as it relates to current relationships with the builders, I, I think um, um, Mr. Lumsden does a great job of keeping them informed and, and progress and direction of the, of the, call it the Blatchford program. And I would think that they would continue to fulfill um, um, their intentions associated with what they've committed to. And I guess too, looking at, when we're looking at again, affordability and environmental goals, the challenge is that that analysis is often focused on capital costs, so the capital difference um, for a house, but doesn't always consider the long-term operating um, benefits or, or cost savings. So again, it just also just seems like a, a pretty significant amount of work to, to work through the long-term affordability impact of, of the environmental goals. If that's a question, I guess, perhaps not, but. Yeah, seeing this right now for the first time, um, I think it's something for us to take away to best identify how we would do this. Uh, understanding that there is a, a previous business model that had a pro forma and an approach to it. Yeah. And, um, and considering how we capture those long-term operational impacts. So I, I, think, I think it's a takeaway for us to figure out the best way to respond to this motion. Yeah, okay, well I mean I think just to spice things up right off the bat, I think I might move an amendment to, to strike the environmental goals from this motion. Again, completely appreciating Councillor Knack's perspective, I think that uh, I think that we, we need to achieve affordability through other means uh, rather than uh, from the environmental side of things. So that's, I don't think that would be friendly, so I'm happy to move that as a, as a formal amendment. Okay, you're moving. Are you moving it now? Yes. So please do. Uh, to strike out environmental goals out of part one. Uh, any cons questions on that specific amendment? Councillor Rice, just on the amendment. Only. Yeah, only the, on the amendment. Then we'll come back to the rest. Okay. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't fully get it why we need, like, delay that piece. And if that is something and then related to uh, our business goal, case goal already, and then what we want to address here by delay to this one. To the mover? Yeah. So why I would remove yeah. that? Yeah. What we want yeah. to address? What, what we want to address? So for me, it's addressing the affordability piece. I think that's a really important conversation, and I think uh, I'm open. You know, really want to see a range of options explored. But for me, I'm not interested in exploring an option where we would decrease the environmental standards uh, to address affordability. I'd much rather look at our rate of return um, and lower those expectations so that we can continue to build in a way that I think we, we urgently need to be building uh, during the climate crisis. Uh, but this is a little bit different from what we, we have been discussing for a long time and we do need to have that 
environment goals and in the business case and for that goals. If we delay this one, I don't know. I I I will leave there and to listen to my colleagues and comments and questions. Maybe. Uh, I'm a little bit confused in here. And so maybe the confused. clarification I could provide is that confusingly, by deleting the environmental goals from this motion, we reinforce our commitment to those goals moving forward. So they would we would not revisit them in the business plan. We would stay true and fast to them by deleting it confusingly. But is that how how that piece contributed to the affordable affordability? Because look at the, the motion, the number one, to me the outcome is to try to address that marked affordability. And so I think what Councillor Knack may suggest, and I appreciate he's not the mover of the amendment, I think what he may suggest is that we need to understand what the cost impact of our environmental goals are in terms of housing affordability and to just have that information for our awareness. And it could be that actually that impact is not significant. Um, what I'm suggesting is that uh, we, there's a lot of data that suggests that the, the impacts are not significant and that the long-term benefits are, are beneficial. Um, and in my mind, that, that existing standard, that existing knowledge is enough to, to leave the, them as they are so as to not introduce uncertainty in terms of our uh, desire to meet those goals. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rice. Any, anyone else, any questions on removing the environmental uh, goals out of the mo main motion? Uh, Councillor Cartmel on that? Yes. Okay, to speak. Uh, Councillor uh, Rutherford, you don't have any questions on the Councillor Salvador on the amendment? No. No? Okay, good. So no more questions on the amendment uh, to speak. Councillor Cartmel to speak to the amendment. Uh, are you sure you want me to go ahead of committee members? Oh, it's your call. I, I don't other Councillor Rutherford to speak. Yes. Oh, good. I didn't know that. <laughs> Councillor Rutherford to speak. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Just to the amendment, I will be supporting this amendment, even though I was an original crafter and and was wanting to see the difference. I I really do see that that could open up a, a, a whole Pandora's box with regards to the the original goals and I think for me the intent is to really say from 2014 to 2023 our perspectives on diversity on on social sustainability have changed and I think we get that with with uh, with this removal still to have that discussion thank you uh, Council Salvador to speak okay uh, quickly I will support I will support removing the environmental goals out of this motion because uh, uh, I agree with Councillor Rutherford that uh, our thinking has evolved around uh, equity and uh, and social sustainability uh, to be more inclusive. I will also argue that our commitment to environmental sustainability has significantly increased over the last number of four, four or five years and we need to not only continue to implement them here, but we also need to look at how we can replicate some of the work being done at Bradford in other areas of the city, including uh, incentivizing private sector developers to look at environmental goals as integral to uh, building the housing stock that we are building today that will be sustainable for decades and decades to come and reduce our emission and environmental footprint. Okay. Uh, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie. So, oddly enough, I agree with every word you said, and it's actually the reason why I think we should, why we shouldn't support this amendment, and here's why. There is what I believe to be an incorrect assumption out in the industry that the environmental goals that we have set for ourselves are far, far, you know, add exorbitant amounts of cost to everything that we're trying to do. I would like to prove that wrong. Because if we're going to have conversations about standards that we're going to set for future greenfield development, future other development, I'd love to have some data I can point to, to UDI, to Canadian home builders and say, we actually did the work. We, lent, we went and actually calculated how much this is adding to the cost. And 
it turns out it's only X amount of dollars and not Y amount of dollars, which you believe to be the case. Um, and so I think it gives us more leverage for some broader climate goals we have to talk. And if by chance I'm wrong, what it, and if it comes back and says, actually, Neil, this adds $200,000 to the price of every home, that's probably good information we should know anyways. Uh, I might not want to change Blatchford still, but it might help us better understand all of the other standards we might set for industry going forward uh, in development across the rest of the city. So for, for the, oddly the same reasons as Mayor Sohi, I would actually encourage councillors to, to not vote in favour of this so that we have some data that we can use in our regular and ongoing conversations with EDI, Canadian Home Builders, and let's, let's show them that maybe they're not accurate in their, in their fear. Thank you. Councillor Cardinal. Thank you. I, I uh, completely agree with Councillor Knack. I think that, you know, for instance, as, as one point of interest, we heard a lot yesterday, a lot yesterday, about having a cross-section of housing uh, and affordable housing. And we, we heard feedback today that Blatchford is not affordable. Whether that's true or not needs to be teased out. Why that is true or not needs a sensitivity test. Is it purely a, the environmental goals? Is it somewhere embedded in the architectural uh, standards? Is it the cost of the land? Is, it, is there something that says that regardless of what we do on our side, uh, any builder that comes into that environment is simply gonna take up any room and not pass along affordability to the end, end buyer. I think if we're gonna talk about doing a, a market test and a market evaluation of what people are willing to pay for, one of the things that we presume that they're willing to pay for is housing that has more environmental stewardship embedded in it. What value is attached to that? What value is attached to that by the builder? And with that knowledge, what value would be attached to that by the ultimate purchaser? To, to say that we are doing something that is our singular most important environmental stewardship activity, to say we're going to go out and test the market, test the value of that in the market, but we don't want to talk about the environmental aspect? That makes no sense. It makes no sense to leave the environmental question out of the environmental stewardship goals. I, why would, because we're afraid of the answer? Why would we, why would we do that? I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I think part of this is to test the assumptions and presumptions that were presented to us about affordability, about cost of housing, about market uptake, about why people might, might be attracted to Blatchford, frankly, why people seemingly are not attracted to Blatchford right now, despite all of the advantages it has over other parts of the city. Um, you know, and environment, environmental stewardship being sort of the icing on that cake. I, I honestly, I, I think that we need to go out and do an honest, uh, true, uh, discreet, dispassionate, third party review of everything Blatchford offers and see where that fits in the market and then clearly understand our choices. And that provides us a data set that we can use to further inform our decisions at Blatchford, but also further inform our aspirations in other places. I would love to see some sort of retrofit district energy ambient temperature system put in around the Twilliger Rec Centre, which has three schools, a rec centre, and oceans of single family homes. Could we do that? How could we do that? What value would people attach to that? What value does that, or what cost does that have within the building sector? All of those are very important questions. And to say that we want to know all of that, except the environmental piece, just doesn't jive. We have to ask this question, or the rest of it really doesn't have any value, in my view. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rice. Uh, I would like to start with my question I, I asked earlier and how that contributes to the market uh, affordability. So this is really uh, struggling and then um, if we don't look at environmental uh, goals and then specifically from current state uh, we have already and then to see and the link back to the, that main motion is second part for the market demand. And we need to understand that from that, yes, yeah, so 
why I'm talking about why uh, this one and then to me doesn't make sense. And because for the main motion, we talk about marked affordability, we talked about marked demand. And if we don't have this review on the environment goals and link back to the uh, business case goals and how we can have the evidence to demonstrate market demand for certain house and also to support that market affordability as well. And then I do think if we are going to do that comprehensive review and then this piece and is worth to include it and for us to have that data and we can make the evidence-based decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reyes. Councillor Stevenson to close. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I appreciate the conversation. I think it's, uh, um, yeah, really great, great to be having this, this talk. I think the question of whether we can afford to build sustainably has been answered. Uh, we're, we're in a climate emergency, and these are the imperatives of what uh, we need to be doing in our city building. Uh, more specifically, the, the, the cost of building sustainably, I think, has also been definitively answered uh, through countless studies that show that uh, the capital cost of upgrades in buildings now uh, versus the long-term operating benefits. Um, the long-term operating benefits well outweigh the upfront uh, cost. Um, I, I worry that by opening this up right now, we, we create uncertainty in terms of uh, the builders who are out there right now who are working in that innovative space to deliver on, again, the type of housing that we need to be building more of. Um, they question if it's worth the effort. They question if they should be making those investments now if we're going to be changing those goalposts. And that's, that's not something I, I think I, I want to be compromising on or that I think we should be compromising on. I think looking at the social sustainability goals, uh, looking for that uh, market affordability is, is a great approach. Um, and the second part of the motion also ensures that we are looking at the value that uh, Edmontonians place on the uh, energy investment uh, and energy upgrades uh, in the community. So I would encourage my colleagues to, to support the amendment and uh, appreciate the mover for bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Please vote. We have five votes. Display the votes, please. That is carried. We are back to the original uh, subsequent with the exclusion of environmental goals. Okay, uh, Councillor Rutherford, question on that? Uh, just, to speak. just to speak. And any other questions? I just need one clarification on this. Uh, with this subsequent, the you will continue to proceed as directed in the past, right? I mean, this is to maybe Mr. Lumsden. Yeah, we would um, we would carry on as business as usual. Business as, as usual. And do, yeah. And, and while do this work that is in yeah. the in the subsequent if it passes. Okay, that's all I right. needed to know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Salvador. Uh, yeah, thank you. So just on the, on the first part of this motion, um, I'm actually just trying to contemplate what would come back. So it's a review of the business case goals. Um, I'm just thinking of a scenario where, you know, we look at the, uh, market affordability. Um, there were some questions around rate of return earlier in the day. And, you know, I, I have questions around some of the economic fundamentals of that. And, you know, we're dealing with market actors here and any, any sort of move on rate of return could possibly just see that delta absorbed by builders and developers when they sell at market price. Um, so just wondering how, is that the type of analysis or review that you'd be coming back with if, if this motion passes? Uh, Councillor Salvador, it's, again, reviewing this, uh, we have the same sort of questions. Um, so you, 
you look at market affordability and potentially set different different pricing to sacrifice on the rate of return and how do you ensure that you can actually make sure that that's passed along um, yeah th those same sort of concerns are are what we see in this however again just seeing this now um, we do our best to um, try and respond and and how do you protect against that etc right and i guess maybe a better question is <laughs> what would a review constitute because is there analysis going to be built into that review that can provide commentary on what i just asked and what you just described mr laughlin well i think it goes back to the business case goals which we've talked uh, about previously um you know noted by the uh by Councillor Rutherford, you know, is there a need to reassess from a sustainable social sustainability perspective? Uh, and then hearing market affordability, how do you how do you tweak the model or adjust the business case goals in order to achieve an outcome? And and this is where I'm I, I'm I'm not sure until we undertake some of this work to to okay. sort of see where it would fall. I think we would need uh, external support to help us with with answering this question which is I've also heard that in some of the questions that have come through as well right okay and then so mayor so he asked sort of even if this motion were to to pass we're still proceeding we're still moving forward um, forgive me if I if I misheard this earlier but I I was under the assumption that there was going to be a housing market review that was conducted anyways going forward is that right yes we were planning to do that um, I think one of the things that this does help us is um, it's it's something that with external support we're we're getting that um, we would what Tom is committed, Mr. Lumsden is committed to, is an ongoing uh, market affordability review, or sorry, market analysis to inform um, how the development progresses. But but this gives us the opportunity to to get some external support in that. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Um, and then, because uh, today we heard we're just starting to sort of see that acceleration, starting to see us move beyond the initial. Um, you know, town town home portion of uh, of Blatchford into different product offerings. Um, this motion in no way calls into question like the entirety of the business case, right? Like we're. I just want to make sure we're still moving forward. Yeah, we are. It, 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 you are correct. We're going to carry on as as we uh, intend, as we plan to do. Uh, this will help us inform kind of future decisions as to how we maneuver through. Okay, and then just a final question. Um, we heard some some commentary from some of the speakers today about uh, contemplating single detached forms, um, and like quite frankly, that's a concern of mine. I I think we've made pretty significant infrastructure investments uh, that would support a higher degree of density in the area. Um, that would not be part of this, correct? Or would it? Not. Not specifically, but as, as Adam indicated, we plan to come back every year with kind of an update to where the business case is going. Um, and if, if in future analysis, we, like I said, if we can achieve the density with single family built form, I don't see why we wouldn't entertain it anyway. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, no, that's good. Thank you so much for answering those. Thank you, Councillor Salvador. Councillor Rutherford? Yeah, I I didn't have questions, but then some of the answers to the previous questions have have spurred some questions for me, just in terms of maybe what my intent of point one was and what the interpretation from administration is, and maybe we need to to revise the the motion to make it more clear. So, um, I guess for me, I'll just say what what my intent was it was to understand that like you could go back and, and, and look at social sustainability goals. So for example, that 2014 document doesn't really talk about equity at all. It doesn't talk about gender-based analysis. It doesn't talk about any of those things. So you, to me, that's its own bucket. Like look at that business case and look at social sustainability from a new fresh 2023 lens. Then there's the rate of return and market affordability that I think are 
a separate piece to that. So I don't want them all lumped together. So do we need to amend the motion? No, that's good clarity. I think, uh, I think we were considering it sort of as a, as a whole part, especially when it had the environmental uh, component, which I know has been struck now, but that it like, was a whole Would it be better part. to be like one, one and then two rate of return with the intent of addressing a market affordability and then three under taken a, like, would that make it more clear for you? Yeah, so, so, so then to, to hear that and then a potential way to respond to Councillor Salvador's question would be, we'd identify with this report coming back if there are any additions that are required related to the social sustainability goals. Yes. And could potentially recommend that this is added as it relates to rate of return with the intent to address market affordability. Um, that would probably be more of a pro forma discussion related to the, the model. So having it explained to me that way, I think that that makes it clearer for what the product would be back. And, and again, through Hugh answering a question that Councillor Salvador asked. Yeah, so I guess just to make it clear, I'll just make that amendment. I don't know if it's considered friendly by this. By yes, friend, that's, that's friendly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. like, so, so just social sustainability goals, period, and then two, rate of return with the intent to address market affordability, three, undertake a comprehensive market, Great. housing market. Good, very good. Because I think that'll just clarify, because for me, my intent, uh, you know, again, it's just recognizing like socially the context is very different than 2014 so let's just do a pulse check on that yeah. in terms of what can and can't be added that's the intent. thank you and i would also see that suggest that we divide it up for voting purposes as well yeah uh okay so councillor stevenson yeah thank you so maybe just in i think that's a great clarification uh, so maybe just focusing on what will now be point two so the rate of return with the intent to address market affordability I, you know, I would, would, would you be able to also explore, because I think the biggest challenge is we could sell the land cheaply, uh, that could lead to the initial home buyer getting a more affordable product, but if the market increases in the next 10 years, there's nothing, the next buyer uh, would just be at the whim of the market, right? It wouldn't matter what the initial price point was. Um, if there's demand in the area, the, those costs would go up. That's that's sort of the nature of a deregulated housing market that we that we have. So would would you also be able to look at some of the other factors in terms of um, you know thinking about long-term affordability, how we fit that in in terms of diversity, having different unit types. I think you've spoken about some of the products that are coming online that maybe offer different price points. Like, can that be part of the discussion as well? Uh, for sure. I think t Mr. Lumsden mentioned that in in answering some of the questions. So, uh, I mean, at minimum with this point, we can actually provide even more details related to the stock that is going to be available within the Blatchford development for the, f for the full build-out. Great. Um, and, and again, still struggling with the, you know, if you sell the land low, are you guaranteeing that you can get it to an affordable point because how do you confirm that with the home builder, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. And and it might even be, and I don't, I if this is a, a, a like, if this is confidential, you don't have to answer, but did the, the business case work in the assumption that to support the 16% non-market housing, that land would be sold below market? Tom? The, like the affordable housing portion? Yeah, does the business case build in that the 16% would be supported through uh, below market sales? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it has, it contemplates either revenue or um, money that can be contributed towards it. Okay, okay, so that's already done. Yeah, yeah so I mean, I think, I think maybe this is more, but yeah, it seems like there's an opportunity to look at affordability, market affordability um, in a range of, elements in terms of the other levers that we have as well in terms of diversity of housing, uh, different price points coming up. And again, looking at things like, again, maybe subdividing garden suites that you have small homes that people can buy, secondary suites, things like that. That would all be possible. Go ahead, yes. Tom. Yeah, yes, it could be. Sorry, I keep missing my mute button. 
yeah, we'll look at all of that through this. And and again, it's this isn't kind of new to the project. We continually explore these ideas all the time. Great, great. Thank you so much. And and, and just to confirm, so point three, the housing market review. What I'm hearing is that is not additional work. Um, you would be you would be doing that anyway. And just wondering if one of the variables again could be looking at the environmental, um, the energy efficiency of the building, in terms of getting to Councillor Cartmel's point before about looking at at how that uh, construction type is valued in in the market. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll undertake to figure out what um, what people value that at and what what it adds to the to the value of the home ultimately. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stephen. Councillor Carmel. Uh, thank you. So, I guess first of all, in part three, would um, would administration be employing a, a third party consultant to undertake that market review? That's or, the way we've done it in the past. Yes. That's the way you've done it in the past. Okay. So yeah. you don't need that. Doesn't need to be spelled out in the motion. That's the way you would do it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. So. I'm really trying to understand then what's really going to come back to us. So I, I'm, maybe I'll try through by way of example. Um, in part one, we're going to review the business case goals with respect to social sustainability. And I'm, we talked, it was mentioned, uh, you know, GBA plus lens. Uh, I'm assuming that part of that social sustainability would be market and near market affordability. Perhaps I'm wrong, but it, but that's a perspective. So if we're going to review the business plan for Blatchford, but we are not talking about anything that with respect to the environmental goals. So that means that every structure must be attached to the district energy plant, district energy system, or be or net zero. Be net zero. And that's not that's not giving. Uh, so. That means that the pace of the development of the district energy system, uh, in essence, governs the pace of development in Blatchford. That if there's not a second or third loop to the system, then there will not be subsequent uh, land opened up. Which doesn't Good. actually change from the current model that we have or the business plan that we have. Well, but if we were examining the social sustainability goals and including environmental aspects of the business plan, then it might. But we've just decided not to do that, so it won't. I, through the clarification, what I took from this is review the Batch Blatchford business case to um, s see if any of the goals or if there's any gaps in the goals related to social sustainability. Um, but one of those gaps might be affordability, and we're not allowed to talk about environmental goals when oh, it comes to affordability. Yeah, so maybe dive in a bit deeper. The district energy system is actually built in a way where it's um, 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 limited in terms of how that price is different from other utility systems, in that it's actually protected to align with those other utility options right. that are provided. And through that, through that subsidized by other taxpayers in the city. He, through, right. through the district energy system itself, which right. to this point has been funded by council uh, through uh, um, debt borrowing, yes. Which speaks in some small way to affordability and overall affordability of owning a home in this place. Just one moment, I'm being corrected by. <laughs> So I might need a second round because uh, I have a few other questions here. I Car just carry I, on. I'll circle back to that. Yeah, I. Um, you know, I wonder about the last time, maybe not the last time, but we've had housing crises before, affordability crises. One once was in the '70s, where uh, the city owned land that it acquired from the province and then made that land available below market value on a single-family home basis in Millwoods. Um, is that something we could contemplate? Understanding that making lots available in a similar way that we make lots available on the enterprise land portfolio, for instance, means single family zoning or individual resident zoning. Or is that precluded? Because we're mm -hmm. 
not a, we're not contemplating changes to the business plan in that respect. The current zoning in Blatchford doesn't allow for single family homes, but as I've mentioned before, if we can, the, the density is like, this is, um, the density identified in the city plan is 140 to 160 units per hectare in transit oriented development. And we're targeting that. So single family homes makes it difficult to achieve that objective. Um, I also suggest that when they, when enterprise land sells their parcels, it's not below market. Well, it was in, when we did it in Millwoods, in the early years of Millwoods, that was what I was alluding to. Yeah. But without single lot, single family lots to sell, we can't contemplate that approach. Yeah, and, I, and going back to Adam's comment, the market, like if we, and, and multiple opinions, if we sell it low to the first person, then ultimately they're gonna, the market's gonna be what the market's gonna be for them. Yeah, my time is up. I've got a few more questions. Thank sorry, you. sorry, I forgot now. Uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, I think I think this change from original to this become more confusing. Um, specifically, and for the rate of return, and then uh, based on this, I assume is we are review and the business case goals and try to say how we can, yeah, help me understand for this read of return and because for the analysis and for the NPV and did here in the report is very clear to demonstrate already. And then what does this read of return with the intent to address the market affordability? And can you describe a little more about that? So I, I look at this as, uh the Blatchford business model was set up in a way where it would have a, a pro forma where at a certain point in time we would recover our costs and in fact make money on the development. In considering market affordability, would we adjust that in any way through land sales or other methods uh, to ensure market affordability? Um, and we do some analysis on that to number one, identify what that could look like and number two, how we can make sure that that happens. So that work is already underway, right? It's already underway, it's not just the... Mm. Sorry, affordable housing is a component of the Blatchford development yeah, following the city policy, but this is a little bit different in yeah, that. Yeah, because we're talking about two different things. That is affordable housing, 16%. This is talking about overall and for the uh, market affordability. Yeah, so this is uh, based on the claims that have been made that it's... Um, too expensive in Blatchford. It's giving us the opportunity to, number one, um, provide our perspective on that, mm -hmm. uh, especially when it's compared to comparable areas within the city. Uh, and number two, adjust the rate of return to do some analysis to determine, you know, what's the right option here in terms of a, a rate of return to ensure market affordability. And if I've interpreted that wrong, I'd like to know because we'd like to do what's expected of count committee in providing this information. And to me, this is something to the extra and then to me, I, I don't think it's necessary to do that because based on what the work have been done for the analysis in place, uh, just my opinion, and, and specifically, and uh, I, I would like to say, for all this work, is there from financial implication perspective, what's the impact? So we need to hire the third part consultant, uh, we need to do the extra work, and do we have the challenge to face our uh, internal uh, manpower source, and do we need uh, add additional budget and cost to do this as well. So I think um, what I would say is we'd undertake this work as part of ensuring that the, the direction that we're taking for Blatchford is aligned with council's expectations or in this case committee. Um, um, so I would consider this part of our work uh, what the cost of it is, I'm not sure. Um, 
resourcing would be um, through outsourcing and, and getting external resources to support us in this. Um, but we would, we would undertake this on the basis of ensuring that we've got alignment with the direction of Blatchford with Council's expectations. So in for doing outsourcing and is additional budget requested or just part of the approved the current budget? It's part of our approved budget. Okay. It's, it's what we would contemplate spending on um, these type of information to forward with the project. So for doing this, and is there any impact on your current work? So your current, I understand that you have an office and for the current office work to do this project management and it will not be impacted by this motion in the past. Uh, no, no, I would suggest this is work, like I said, that we always kind of look at opportunities and, and things that we should explore in Blatchford and just like we do in all of our work at the city. So this is uh, maybe changing the direction a little bit and, and more formalizing it, but not, not really impacting uh, how much work we would be doing. Okay, uh, thank you for your answer. That's my question. Thank you. I haven't asked questions on this. Uh, I am fine with one and understand the intent, and but I'm really nervous about number two because if I understand correctly, the original model or business case, as you said, was to make upfront investments, then they recover those costs over time and generate, generate a profit, right? Correct. Now, with the intent of number two, we, even though it's a report that will come to committee for discussion, in my mind, that's a fundamental shift because now we're asking, can we use that return to create affordability by giving a break on on land or anything else to to uh, to the to, to the builders it's a change in the business model i from from the goals perspective uh, the vision for blatchford i'm not sure that it does because it's more of a transition from the goals to the execution of the work the business model was developed for as you said build out and get to a a return or a yeah. break-even point at this point yeah. in the life cycle of the development and then make money. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as, as I look at attachment one, the business case goals, uh, I don't see it as a, as a deviation from that from my perspective and certainly would ask Tom to, to weigh in. It's more of the business model and approach we would take for Blatchford. Yeah, but if you were to generate say $40 million net present value. And if you wanna shift that to give say $20 million should go toward affordability by giving discount on land to builders, right? Wouldn't that be a shift in the business model? That, that's what I'm saying. It's a shift in the yeah. business model. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say that it's a, a change in the goals for Blatchford, yes. the, the vision yeah. for the community. Yes, yeah, well, yeah, but the business case. But is, the business model, yes. And that, that uh, makes me nervous, right? Uh, because if I, I agree with Councillor Nack on affordability overall, but affordability in the in the infill area is not just confined to Blatchford. It is a broad, broader issue of affordability related to infill that we do in, in a mature neighborhood. Maybe we need to have that discussion, how we make infill in general affordable, right? So, uh, uh, and also like I don't know whether those benefits actually get transferred to homeowners, uh, 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 or, or they are absorbed into into profits for the. For, so I I I am really con nervous about number two, right? Uh, maybe I'll speak to if when when we come to that, right? But I am, have concerns about that. Uh, number three is fine. I guess that's a work you would undertake uh, from my perspective. Uh, Costa Stevenson. Yeah, that actually segues nicely into into the questions I wanted to ask. Is that you know I think I think we maybe have landed too firmly on the mechanism for addressing market affordability being the rate of return. Um, so I can ask the mover. You are the mover. Um, just wondering if if you would if it would still meet your intent if we just said um, explore strategies to address market affordability, uh, recognizing that the rate of return could be one. Um, again, housing diversity, there could be a range of different tools that are brought to bear on that. 
I mean, as long as that includes w rate of return, I mean, you're essentially adding more options, which in my mind is not a bad thing, um, so. Is that, would that be amenable to administration? Yeah, I would. I would um, support that. Okay. I, I guess I would, I would say not disagree with Tom. <laughs> um, adding to. But it kind of goes to the mayor's comment that are we addressing market affordability in Blatchford or is market affordability a bigger question in the city? So I, yeah, um, yeah, we'll do our best to, to look at what those options are and yeah. use rate of return potentially as one of those or, yeah. uh, but, but that yeah. would be a flag. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate that. I mean, again, I don't think uh, Blatchford can fix, fix the broader societal things, but if we, we can just, even just be thinking a bit strategically as as the land owner and developer, um, even if it's small modifications that help. Just thinking too, I was um, reminded that you know we do do our first place program uh, on surplus school sites. Again, I don't think that really helps with the resale. From what I'm reading, it's not a long term affordability piece. But yeah, if if it would be friendly to just open that up to say uh, explore strategies to support market affordability? Yeah, friendly, friendly. Okay, so maybe we'll, we'll do that. So two would just so read. So we will be changing the rate of return to explore options with the intent to address market affordability? And I would even say support market affordability, not address, because again, I, I recognize you can't fix it. Yeah. But just explore, yeah, explore uh, approaches to support market affordability. Okay, okay. Is that friendly? As Cons long as that includes rate of return, which I think I heard from Mr. That doesn't. Yes. Then I'm then I'm okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you please make that change? May uh, we get clarity can on? You say it again, Councillor Stevenson. Your intent for change. So two would read. Uh, I'm probably saying it differently every time. Explore approaches to support market affordability. As, and sorry, the administration provider report to come out and following. Yeah. Two. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay, it's changed now. Uh, all right, so to speak, anyone to speak? Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, I think that this has been great conversation today, though I think we, we as a committee or council need to consider when we can do a notice of motion as opposed to a subsequent so we can get on with our agendas. But um, I think that what I wanna highlight here is is really hone in on the the discussion on point two around the explore now exploring approaches to market affordability and i get that this is a bigger societal issue and i get that when you compare to infill that there's a cost i i know i lived in an infill in inglewood which is right beside i live in an infill now in calder i get it but i think that the difference between us being the developer being a public sector developer versus a private sector developer is exactly what some of the speakers today discussed with us in, in that we are not necessarily in the business of making profit if it is for the public good. And so what I'd also like to highlight is that this motion today by no means puts any of these into any kind of concrete setting. It simply generates a report for further discussion about what could and may be um, maybe we get it back and it really highlights that all the approaches of negative and unintended consequences to market affordability, and that's okay. But I think that it is a really important piece to talk about because even when I think about that comment, again, from the speakers about we're selling to the 1%, and, and it's true, and I think about even the fact that we're building this amazing sustainable community and through that, and through it being unaffordable market-wise, we're perpetuating energy poverty. 
and, and we haven't talked about that yet, but it's true. It's basically saying the most affluent get the cheapest rates on energy. Um, so I think it is worth a discussion. This is generating a report, and I think it is absolutely worth that discussion. And I, and I know there's nervousness around it, but this doesn't in no means mean that we're making the decision to go forth and do these things. So I really hope that my council colleagues see that and see that intent and see the, the need for this discussion, given how unique Blatchford is and given that we are the developer for this land. It is unique. We can do things that you can't do in other areas. And so let's explore that. What can, what are the possibilities that could be? Um, and then just, again, to reiterate on point one, social sustainability has changed a lot. Um, even the term sustainability has changed a lot in how it's defined from 2014 to 2013, let alone the social context and lenses that we need to look at from and our current social realities, right? In 2014, there wasn't a pandemic. It hadn't exposed some of the cracks in in our societal structures. And so I think it is important to look at if we really want Blatchford to be something that others can look to for inspiration, I think it needs to look at those factors of social e equity and uh, diversity as well. So that's, that's where I'll leave it, but thank you very much for um, bringing this forward, Councillor Knack, and for the great discussion on this item. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford, Councillor Cartwell. Thank you. Uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, Councillor Rutherford's uh, comments. I do think this is a conversation worth having, and, and she touched on a few things, uh, you know, um, energy poverty, uh, affordability, social sustainability. And I think that, I quite frankly think that the review of the business case is gonna expose that those things are not addressed in the business case. Primarily because those are relatively new considerations that have come since the business case was constructed. And that's, that's perfectly okay. And I think in point three, we're gonna, we're gonna find out uh, with clarity through a third party uh, objective uh, outside opinion, uh, what, what the costs are in Blatchford versus what the costs are in other places, you know, for units of equal size with equal attributes. And we'll get a sense of, of affordability and that being one aspect of social sustainability uh, where Blatchford compares. And then we're gonna explore approaches to address market affordability. But we're not gonna talk about the environmental part of that. And we're not gonna talk about the architectural part of that. And we're not gonna talk about the built form part of that. So we're gonna say, do an analysis of what variables you can change to speak to market affordability without changing any of the variables. I, I, it's an empty exercise, uh, point two, as far as I'm concerned. If we're, not gonna, if, if we're not gonna consider that environmental piece, and I know that's been considered and rejected, but if we're not going to, then you know, and, and, and again, appreciating Councillor Rutherford's comments that, uh, you know, this is not pri pub private development, it's public development, and, and it comes with a different set of uh, goals and aspirations, and, and, you know, those are audacious goals which are to be lauded. But I think the people we represent deserve to know what the premium is for those goals. And we have chosen, we have deliberately chosen not to tease out those costs to tell them what that premium is and to make that choice. And that is where the rest of this fails. We absolutely should be talking about what the costs of those, those uh, goals and aspirations are. We absolutely should be trying to understand where that fits. When you build up the cost of a home in Edmonton, whether it's a town home or a single family home or a condominium, you should know how those costs lay out. You should know if you live in a district that is having its utilities subsidized by the rest of Edmonton, how that plays into affordability. And those that are subsidizing you to live in that place should know what they're paying to allow you to live in that place. 
but we're not going to talk about that. And, uh, and I, that confuses me completely, quite frankly. So, uh, you know, this, we'll, we'll talk about it again, I guess, when we get the results of this report. We'll talk about it again at utility when we talk about the district energy system and, and uh, you know, what it needs for further investments to sustain itself. Um, but I, I really continue to fail to understand why we restricted this conversation. Um, but I'm not on committee, so I guess that's where it sits. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cardinal. Councillor Stevenson. Oh, Councillor Neck will close it. Yeah. Uh, Still gathering my thoughts, I guess. Um, yeah, really appreciate, again, uh, administration for coming forward with the report. I guess we've already talked about the report. Appreciate the mover coming forward with this uh, subsequent motion. Um, you know, I, I have a really different understanding about what's in front of us. I think that it allows us to explore a range of different methods to uh, increase market affordability, uh, including built form, uh, including other, other tools uh, that have precedence like our first place program. And I think that those are, those are worth exploring absolutely. You know, I'm usually really open to, to exploring all options, looking at different, different iterations. Um, but I think that there are times where we need to stay uh, committed to certain goals and, and the sustainability goals of, of Blatchford are one of those things. And, and I don't disagree that they are obviously unique to the community, but I think that when we decide um, to commit to those, all else being equal, what can we do? How can we uh, stay committed to the sustainability goals and what are the other pieces that we can move? What are the other uh, variables? And I think having that fixed piece actually allows us to be more creative uh, in coming up with those other solutions and again helps develop innovation uh, for other communities uh, to show them a way forward uh, for sustainability. So keeping that as the guiding star, keeping that uh, point of reference fixed uh, helps us chart a better course forward, um, which is I think the, the overall intent of Blatchford. So excited to support this motion and excited uh, to see the work that comes back. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sohi. <laughs> I think uh, I'm very struggling and for, for the motion. Um, as Councillor Catmail mentioned. So if we're doing something and I, I asked certain question related to my struggling this today. Um, specifically, if we are looking at the key challenge we are facing here and also if we look at the message you received from the public and from our Edmontonians who look at this project and the city as a land developer and did this project uh, for the past, I say I would say like 12 years since 2010. Um, what's really a problem or really um, solution we want provided? Um, I feel like, yes, it's time for us to look at the development model. And it's time to look at finding the better solution for us to move forward because we still have lots of work needs to be done in this project. But the doing something actually really can support, help us move forward. And instead of just to come back with the report and specifically to refract some work already is already, what I heard is already undergoing. Is This is just the, makes that work more formal. So for that report, uh, additional reports add, additional report add and to the administration work note I think that is one thing I am concerned about. Another thing, and to address social sensibility and specifically for 
market affordability and without talking about specific the cost related to, to the construction related to the development. I don't think how much value the information come back we can use really help to improve uh, the situation or the challenge we're facing right now. Um, uh, but like I heard my colleagues, they say we do want to get some additional information and for further decision. Um, I think from, I, I appreciate that intention there as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Before I go to Councillor Nack, very quickly, I, you know, Bladford development was a very hot topic during the 2021 election and uh, it did create quite a bit uncertainty in the development community. I heard from developers or builders who were building in that area, what the future will look like. And uh, I have heard from uh, uh, people who are living there now, uh, what they don't wanna see change in the, in the business model or the ambition, ambitions of, uh, of Blatchford. Uh, and uh, so I, that's kind of the source of my nervousness around, uh, around these changes because I wanna make sure that whatever we do, if from my perspective, we need to keep the business case intact and we need to keep that ambition on building a sustainable community and greener community uh, intact. I will support this uh, uh, motion because it does speak to one component of affordability within the goals of uh, Blatchford. Uh, uh, look forward to what comes out of it. I just want to be clear though, in my, from my, where I'm sitting in this chair, from my perspective, uh, I would not be supporting changes, changes to the business case other than tweaks on the on the edges and I will not be supporting any significant change or, or any changes to the environmental goals and uh, and the ambition, ambition that was set out in the, in the in the original plan. I just wanna be clear and transparent on that. Uh, with that, I will take, uh, go to Council Nack to close. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi. Um, appreciate all the feedback. Um, so a few thoughts and, and um, yeah, I, I I'm not going to dwell much on the, the previous discussion, but I, I would just echo a lot of Councillor Cartmel's pieces. I, 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 th I think we're going to get incomplete information. This is better than no information. Um, so I'd like to get that. And more focusing on sort of one of the things that makes me nervous right now is, is that, you know, I look at, and I appreciate I heard that there might be some row housing units coming along that are be 450,000, which would be great. But right now, that's not what's on the market. The lowest price is five hundred and twenty thousand dollars, then five sixty, then five seventy, then six ten, then seven eighty five, and then eight forty eight. Um, so what, frankly, makes me really nervous is having a space that nobody can afford to live in, except for. And Councilor Rutherford touched on this earlier. Uh, she nailed it uh, in, in her points. Right now, this is not a neighborhood for the average Edmontonian. And. I agree that uh, you know generally I wasn't looking to change the environmental goals, but we need to have some type of conversation because if nothing changes, this will continue. This will be our path, and then truly it it, it will be a neighborhood for the top one percent. And we have a neighborhood like that. We have a couple of neighborhoods like that in the city, and and I actually don't think that's what our city goals are. Um, and so I think something needs to evolve. I'm not looking at, and I think this motion doesn't blow up everything, just to be clear. I don't, I think we're, we've got generally good goals, but there is clearly an affordability issue for this neighborhood that we, we believe so strongly in. So we need to have some type of conversation about this. And, and I don't think this will be a complete conversation, but honestly, at least it keeps the conversation alive. And then the next members of executive committee can maybe have a different conversation when that comes back in June, because um, it's just, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know how we best tackle that. Um, at least in this case, though, we do have one lever that isn't available in all of the other communities. So I appreciate that, the, and, and you're right, Mayor So is that there's an affordability issue for infill across most of the city. 
but one of our mechanism to help address that is through the zoning bylaw renewal and increasing the number of units, and we're going to be able to do that. Um, and, and it's had some benefits already. I think about the 10 units of row housing built right across the street from where I live. It replaced two single family homes. They built 10 units of row housing and they all entered the market at 320 or $330,000. And the reason I remember that is because that is still the anomaly in our mature neighborhoods for affordability. If you wanna pay that kind of money for a home, chances are you have to go outside the hand right now. So we need to have a serious chat about do we want people to have that option. And so this, this information will start us down an initial path, but we might need to be willing come June to, to reflect on how we want to make sure everyone can actually have access to a neighborhood which right now is not not available to people okay. so thank you thank you Councillor Nack uh, please vote we have five votes uh, display the votes please that is carried and we have five minutes remaining. Uh, I don't know how much debate my subsequent is going to generate. Just for purpose, if you could just put it on the on the screen, I'll get a sense from committee members. If there's going to be quite a bit of debate, then I'm going to withdraw it. Then maybe look at maybe doing that as a notice of motion sometime, right? So, because we have a lot of agenda to to gen, uh, to look after yet. So, just want to get a sense from council colleagues. You have questions. Uh, you have questions? Okay. Okay, then I'm going to withdraw it, Madam Clerk, and uh, I'm going to think about making it sometime. So, some, I'll, I'll, I'll think about whether I need to bring it back as a sub, uh, notice of motion. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll take a break here. Uh, just before we go on break, can we agenda, you know, realistically, are we going to so let's see. finish? Uh, we're done with 7.1. Uh, 7.2, 7.3, 7.4 is done. Uh, 7.6 says the boundary and council compensation. Uh, then we have speakers that we're going to, uh, 1.1. Yeah, that's one we'll come after the break. Uh, rationalizing and right sizing municipal assets. Adam, how critical is that? I mean, to be dealt with today. <laughs> it is critical, but is it to be dealt with today? And uh, uh, no, it's a good uh, it's a good item to discuss before we get to budget. Okay. Okay, we'll keep it on the agenda. We'll see how it goes. And. Bylaw 20304, City of Edmonton Ward Boundaries. Councillor Rutherford, you have a amendment, all right? So some, what do you have on this? I, I have a refer back motion. Refer back. So we could deal with that very quickly, right? Because uh, uh, if you refer back, then we just getting it some other time to deal with it. Uh, can we just bring it forward, refer it back with uh, whatever motion? Uh, the yes, I'll intended? move that we bring 7.6 yeah. forward. Yeah, we have two minutes to do it. Uh, Okay. Yeah. No, rushing? Okay. Well, it's just, I, about, it's just about the word boundary between anomic and point, okay. point of order. Okay, let's, let's, you know what, take a break. We'll point come of back. order. Quick question and before take a break. Yeah. So you withdraw your, your motion? Yeah, I withdraw it. I uh, and because, because I, I do think the uh, question just for your motion right now, you withdraw. Yeah, I withdraw it. I withdrew it because uh, we don't have the time to deal with it today. I'll bring it back some okay. to a, some sort of motion, notice of motion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll take a break. We'll be back at three forty-five with item seven point eight, employee psychological health and safety program and practices. We have three speakers on it. Hey, Madam Clerk. So, sorry. Can you repeat the question? So we will be back at three forty-five with item 7.8, which we made time specific for 345. That's correct, yes, and we have, we three, have three speakers. speakers on it. Okay, good.
psychological health and safety program and practices. Uh, okay. Uh, do a roll call. Okay, Councillor Rutherford is here. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Councillor Nack is here. Indeed. And we're waiting for Councillor Rice and Councillor Stevenson to arrive. And it is 345. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. I, I joined as well to this council. So let's see who else is joining us online. Good afternoon. Uh, okay. Councilor Jens is there. Yeah, that's Councilor Jens. Councilor Rice is here now. All right, we will start with the presentation from our administration. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be joined today by Sindel Taylor, to my left, the branch manager of Workforce Safety and Employee Health, Chad Nelson, over on the right hand side, the acting director of Disability Management, Wellness, and Mental Health, John Dowds our lead chaplain and senior mental health consultant, and Janelle Pelizari, our mental health healthy living consultant. So we're here today to provide a report in follow up to the motion from the March 22nd, 2021 executive committee meeting. That being that administration provide a report to committee on its employee psychological health and safety programs and practices utilizing the National Standard of Canada for Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace as a benchmark to meet or exceed and include recommendations for regular reporting. <clears throat> Occupational health and safety best practices have expanded over recent years to include a broader focus on psychological health and safety. Additionally, the COVID-19 pandemic has increased the recognition that psychological health and safety benefits all employees and employers. Psychological health and safety proactively prepares organizations to deal with workplace, workplace mental health, reduce mental harm, and promote employee mental health. As per the national standard, which I will refer to as the standard, the vision for a psychologically healthy and safe workplace is, quotes, one that actively works to prevent harm to the psychological health of workers in negligent, reckless, or intentional ways and promotes psychological well-being, close quote. Administration is committed to a psychologically safe and healthy work environment for all city employees and we strive to create that environment one which bolsters employee well-being and provides support in difficult times. Aligned to the city's cultural commitment of safe and reinforced in the city manager's occupational health and safety commitment statement, we place tremendous value on creating and sustaining a psychological, healthy and safe work environment. Next page, please. Or next slide, please. Thank you. The standard is a set of voluntary guidelines, tools and resources intended to guide organizations in promoting mental health and preventing psychological harm in the workplace. The standard was commissioned by the Mental Health Commission of Canada in 2013. It assists organizations to support employee psychological health and safety needs, along with meeting legislative requirements to provide employees with a psychologically safe work environment. Included in the standard are these 13 factors of psychological health and safety that workplaces should consider. Attachment two to our council report details how administration is meeting or exceeding the 13 factors, including relevant updates to programs and resources within each factor since the March 22nd appearance before executive. Next slide, please. In the development of this voluntary standard, their technical committee recognized that the requirements and complexities of organizations and employees vary considerably. The standard states that improving psychological health is a voluntary ongoing process of continual improvement 
rather than a minimum standard imposed by regulators. And our work regarding implementation of the standard has been and continues to be in consultation with experts in the field of psychological health and safety in the workplace. Additionally, we have a member on our own wellness team who's with us today, Jessica Culling, who has received a professional certificate training for psychological health and safety from the Canadian Mental Health Association. The standard's approaching 10 years since its initial release, and it is currently under review, a process that will take 18 to 24 months to complete. We have been advised that a couple of things that are being considered in this review are alignment of the standard with ISO 45003, which is a guideline from the ISO for managing psychosocial risk within an occupational health and safety management system, and additional workplace factors around inclusion and trauma, which could lead to an expansion on the current 13 factors. Next slide, please. As highlighted in the report, the city has an established track record. Oh, my total apologies. I've gone too quickly here. One slide back, please. Sorry, and may I just clarify, what is ISO? Oh, uh, my apologies. I've got the exact. It is the International Organization for Standardization. Okay, thank you. No problem. As highlighted in the report, the city has an established track record of recognizing and prioritizing psychological health and safety in our organization, even prior to the standard being released in 2013. Examples include the implementation of a peer support program, support for employees and families through the city chaplain, employee and family assistance programs, wellness promotion resources, wellness fairs and wellness committees. And we've continued to expand our support in the workplace and the report identifies the programs that relate to each of the, of the 13 factors. I do wanna quickly highlight some of the expansions that have occurred over the last year. In terms of leadership support, the OHS commitment statement I referenced earlier now explicitly includes psychological health and safety. In the trauma space, we're developing a corporate-wide consistent response to traumatic incidents and have ongoing review and revisions of workplace violence and harassment policies and procedures. We are looking for opportunities to enhance trauma-informed best practices in that space. In training, we have developed domestic violence and our workplace training. Our hiring manager certification experience, which supports the candidate experience. We have anti-racism training. We've talked to you about this previously. Um, as you're aware, the implementation of GBA Plus across the city and Fire Rescue Services is providing the BOS program, which is before occupational stress, to its employees. Last year, we trained an additional 1,197 employees on the Working Mind, a mental health program, and our total trained employees is just under 4,000. In terms of resources and supports, we've got a hybrid work arrangement program, which is considered an enhancement to our employees' mental health. And we have an upcoming new corporate enterprise resource planning system to help with learning and growth plans for individual employees. We've increased our number of peer support teams from uh, by six teams. We now have 18, sorry, 18 teams across the organization and three more an anticipated to be active by the end of Q2 2023. And development is underway for a mental health, health living evaluation framework to inform programming and resource allocation efforts. Next slide. The standard recommends uh, that organizations implement a psychological health and safety management system in order to assess whether the 13 factors have been embedded into policies, processes, and interactions in the workplace. So this PHSMS, it's a terrible acronym, so this psychological health and safety management system supports organizations through five main elements. Um, which are listed on this slide, commitment and leadership, planning, implementation, evaluation, and corrective action. Sorry, that's one element. And then the last one is management, review, and continual improvement. So a, a psychological health and safety management system 
is intended to be preventative for the entire workforce in the same way that our occupational health and safety systems are preventative for physical injuries and illnesses for the entire workforce. It gives a customized and sustainable framework that's ongoing, flexible, built over time and integrated into existing and future policies and procedures. So the city is a member and I'm sorry for all the acronyms, of the Alberta Municipal Health and Safety Association, which is referred to as AMSA. This is a non-profit organization that guides the city in implementing, evaluating, and maintaining its health and safety management system. The city received a certificate of recognition, which is called CORE, in April of 2022, that recognized the strong health and safety management system in place, and the audit findings also noted our focus on psychological safety. Consistent with the recommendations in the standard, the city is using a psychological health and safety management system to integrate the 13 factors of the standard into our overall occupational health and safety, and safety system. And on page five of the council report, we have summarized um, how we are doing this in relation to the five elements of a PHSMS. In March of 2021, during our discussion with Council, administration was asked about the idea of adopting the standard. We advised at that time that we did not have the capacity to undertake the development of a new internal audit process. And in addition, we felt strongly that the formal adoption of the standard was not a value add to the work we were already undertaking. Since March 2021, we've continued to align our programs and practices with the 13 factors. And again, given that the standard is under review, we use it as a guide, but we also look to additional tools and standards, the ISO 45003 being one of them to continue to evolve our programs. There has been a significant positive development in Alberta for psychological health and safety I also want to tell you about. In September of this year, AMSA received approval from the Government of Alberta for their new Health and Safety Certificate of Recognition audit element. Our Workforce Safety and Employee Health Group will be working with AMSA to pilot this new audit element in 2023. This will further embed psychological health and safety into our existing OHS systems, which will mean that we will, at our next core audit in 2025, not only be externally reviewing our health and safety system, but also this new psychological health and safety element will be included as part of the process to maintain our certificate of recognition. We view this as the most efficient use of our resources while furthering the aim of ensuring a healthy and safe workplace for employees. Last slide, please and thank you. The City of Edmonton is intentional about fostering psychological health and safety in the workplace, including addressing it in a systematic way. We recommend that further reporting to Council is accomplished by an annual memorandum that highlights and captures relevant updates and information on employee psychological health and safety and the City's commitment to meet or exceed the requirements of the standard. Thank you very much and uh, we look forward to answering any questions you might have. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. If you don't mind, please stepping back. We have uh, uh, three members of the public to uh, uh, make presentation to us. I will uh, call your names. Brandy Thorne, if you could please have a seat up here in the front. Yeah, that'll be great. Uh, Joanne Kobilika, Kobaika, sorry, online, okay. Joanne, are you there? We'll check if you're. I'm here. Okay, good, thank you. And uh, Philip Penrod, you're here. Phil. Yes. Good, all right. Each of you will have five minutes, and thank you for coming back. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we appreciate, uh, so, uh, and after you're done, uh, committee members and council members may have questions to you. So please go ahead. Um, you turn your mic on, up here you go. Your Worship, esteemed councillors, we thank you for this opportunity to speak today regarding Employee Psychological Health and Safety Programs and Practices Report. I'm Brandy Thorne. I'm the, one of the co-chairs for the Mental Health Action Research Team for the Greater Edmonton Alliance. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today on behalf of the tens of thousands of our members represented here today through the Greater Edmonton Alliance. 
Some delegates, as you might have noticed, were in attendance this morning, and again this afternoon, some online, from our member institutes, including faith groups from our Lutheran, Anglican, United, and Roman Catholic parishes, union groups from the Iron Workers Local 720, United Associations of Plumbers and Pipefitters Local 488, Civic Service Union 52, and the Coalition of Edmonton Civic Unions, as well as our community groups represented by Friends of Medicare. Let me begin with Gia's review of the report to City Council. It is nice to see a robust report. Um, there is a list, an uh, extensive list of many psychological safety programs and practices, um, many newer programs since uh, the last report, and policies developed um, are continuing to be planned and developed um, as referenced in the report. So our judgment is obviously psychological safety is uh, considered important and it's, it's very obvious to us. As a broad-based coalition, GIA is proud to be a part of this growing development and our advocacy work on it. We see signs of hope towards the end goal of improved mental health for the employees and their families. We were told a total community of 30,000 people. It's a step in the right direction towards our shared interest of full Im implementation of the standard. We, have produ uh, we had a productive conversation last week with city administration, and we're thankful and grateful for that and those opportunities, where we feel the community groups we represent are being heard. This report, as informed by city administration, was a product of the core health and safety assessment that under was undergone in the spring. Um, we share the concerns that uh, resources allocated for psychological safety management reporting uh, do not currently meet the need um, that we feel. Uh, if it were not for the core audit and city administration's request to specifically draw out the components of psychological safety programs for the council report, we fear that that report may not have been as robust. Um, timing with the core report was maybe perhaps helpful. We have concerns that remain about the report as it is presented. <clears throat> we still do not see in the report any evaluation of the programs and policies. There are very few, if any, metrics included in the report. However, we did review the most recent Glint survey in conjunction with this report, the last of which we can talk about is 2020. Um, we understand some measures have been and probably have been taken to communicate better, maybe ask better questions or to increase survey participation for the onger, um, for the one that's ongoing right now. Um, with that said, from the 2020 Glint survey, we can see that participation fell to 52% compared to 70% in the prior one in 2018. At first glance, we see this as a significant indicator about the engagement levels in, of employees and may indicate some issues with lack of trust and or lack of action. Also, council report, the council report itemized uh, a couple notable ones, the Safe Disclosure Office and the Innovative Chaplains Counseling as two of the programs, but the Glint survey reveals only 4% and 2% of the people with workplace concerns use those programs respectively. In fact, the majority, 51% of respondents in the survey said they do not report concerns, of which of those 51%, 54% do not believe it would make a difference. It is this context that I will yield my time for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we will go to Joanne uh, Gobilica. Oh, you, okay, Philip Van Rod was go second. Okay, go ahead, you. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, and good afternoon, esteemed councillors. I want to focus my remarks this afternoon through the lens of the very first of the 13 factors impacting psychological health and safety in the workplace as outlined in the national standard and repeated in the report under consideration today. To quote, factor one, organizational culture. An organizational culture that enhances psychological safety is characterized by trust. It goes on, but I want to draw your attention to that word, trust. It also includes honesty, respect, civility, fairness, psychological and social support, and lastly, recognition and reward." End quote. 
As my colleague and friend, Ms. Thorne, has pointed out, there is much to be celebrated in the city's work on this file to date. And I will reiterate that we see significant progress on this file. The programs and tools being developed and deployed by the administration are innovative and do seem to be effective. We are most pleased with the emerging collaboration and are thankful to have met with representatives from administration as recently as last week. All of this said, we are concerned that this progress and so much hard work and resources may be jeopardized by the very real deficit of trust that exists in the overall relationship between the City of Edmonton's managers and its workers. And to speak to this uh, trust deficit, we sought to recruit a testimonial today from among your workers, and we were unable to get someone to come here in person. I'll let their own words explain why. But first, I'll just mention factor 12 from the 13 factors, psychological protection. To quote, psychological protection is present in a work environment where workers' psychological safety is ensured. Workplace psychological safety is demonstrated when workers feel able to put themselves on the line, ask questions, seek feedback, report mistakes and problems, or propose a new idea without fearing negative consequences. To our testimonial. My work often includes dealing with difficult situations, says this employee, verbal aggression and discrimination included. I often suffer from burnout and emotional exhaustion. Due to this, I feel most harassment and discrimination in the workplace is overlooked. I believe many employees are scared to report problematic behavior in the workplace. I and my colleagues fear retaliation for speaking up about concerns, and I do not trust the process of the Safe Disclosure Office. It seems we still have lots of work to do. We do see evidence of honesty and respect and civility and fairness, psychological and social support and recognition and reward in the work being reported upon today. However, we also see too little transparency in the re release of the results of audits such as the core audit mentioned today. This means there is also too little accountability because decisions about if or how to address uh, where the current problem, programs and tools are falling short of the national standard are too often being made behind closed doors or without meaningful engagement with frontline workers or the broader public. Make no mistake, it is our assertion that the pursuit of the national standard is not a goal that begins and ends with the mic within the microcosm of the city corporation. Rather, it has far-reaching impacts for the common good of all Edmontonians and Albertans and Canadians. Trust can be reviewed or viewed as a precious heirloom vase and once broken, it can only be painstakingly repaired. The evidence of the break will always remain. We commend the work that is being done to repair the legacy of broken trust that all of us in this room have inherited. We acknowledge that few, if any of us, actually contributed to the original breaking of trust, and yet it most assuredly rests with us to mend things. This painstaking and yet worthy work requires the raw material of transparency and the reliable, if heavy, tool of public accountability. Edmontonians have elected you, as individuals and as a council, to steward transparency and to wield deftly the tool of public accountability. We expect you to do this work faithfully in service of the common good. Be assured that GS stands continuing to be ready to participate in this process. Okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next, we will go to Joanne Kovilika. Good afternoon, councillors, and also Mayor Sohi. Each week, more than 500,000 employees miss work due to mental health concerns. Mental illness accounts for two-thirds, up to two-thirds of the long-term disability costs. The national standard is, looks at 
the whole area of the um, shows that it decreases the days absent and also increases the employee engagement and pays dividends to the organization willing to invest in employee wellness by protecting and supporting their physical and mental health at work. As the National Authority on Organizational Excellence, Healthy Workplace and Mental Health at Work, Excellence Canada provides excellent frameworks, standards, consulting, training, and independent verification and certification to organizations of all sizes and sectors. It also includes the IOS 4503. Excellence Canada has partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Association developing this assessment benchmark in 2015. It has assessed organizations publicly and private businesses across Canada. Both the University of Calgary and the University of Alberta are networking provinces as well as other educational institutes. The purpose of Excellence Canada assessment, it is a benchmark. It is not an audit tool. It is to assess and benchmark the association against uh, the mental health framework and provide feedback on strengths, opportunities, scores comparing to other award-winning organizations and identifying winning practices. Excellence Canada assessment can and or will enrich Amish process that is just the beginning in development, which is preferred and proposed by the administration with essential information that will drive that tra transparency, accountability, and of course, trust. You can have all the programs and the tools, but if the, P if the employees are not using them, what good is it? In addition to this, the process allows for the building of relationships with employees using emotional intelligence management. G is promoting the adoption of this National Standard of Canada for psychological health and safety in the workplace as an official policy for the City of Edmonton thus not a, allowing for the reporting system to be shelved. If council is to prove, prove, approve for this one-time foundation benchmark assessment, it will assist in furthering the development of accountability, transparency, and trust. This will need to be uh, recorded as a separate line as the City of Edmonton develops its budget and not under admin as they have, not, they have requested not to use Excellence Canada. We believe that to approve that the one-time benchmark assessment and the associated costs supported in the 2023 budget, the City of Edmonton could be a leader in Alberta and Canada. First Western Canadian municipality to have received a certificate, may it be gold, silver, platinum, it would be a huge step forward and a driver for all other employers to follow your lead. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for, sorry, I got distracted a bit. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Now I'll ask council members, starting with the committee members, if we have questions. This was exempted by Councillor Rutherford, so I'll ask if you have Councillor Rutherford questions, or can we go to Councillor Nack? He's on the list. I, I can start by putting a motion on the floor. Uh, no, we'll come back oh, after yes, we've got sorry, questions, questions to, the, questions to members. Have any questions okay. to the uh, Councilor Nack? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sophie, and thank you, thank you all for coming. So I just want to make sure I summarize what I heard. I sort of heard three three asks, although I think two of them are sort of connected. Um, so just correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so one of which is formally adopting the standard, and then contained within that is the third-party verification through Excellence Canada. So those are sort of one and two, but I think connected. Is that correct? Um, no, uh, the Excellence Canada would be like a one-time benchmark one -time. assessment. Okay. okay, so that's good. I've just got that clarification. So that you'd be doing that as a one-time, So, but that is the second ask. And then the third one is making sure there's, um, wanting to understand if there's public access to things like the audits and those reports. That's the third item I heard. Is that correct? 
Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah. Perfect, okay. Uh, then just the other question I think I have, uh, and I'm gonna ask this of administration as well, is that, um, you know, you, you mentioned you had some good sit down conversations with them. It sounds like generally speaking, we're moving in the right direction. Um, it, do you know, like, is there a cost to the Excellence Canada thing? Is that is that what the barrier is? I'm a little, I, I'm just not sure why that particular, those particular asks why we're not sort of meeting. Is it because there's a large cost or any details you can share on that? Uh, we, I did ask um, Excellence, Russ with Excellence Canada if there was a cost and he did give me an estimate over the phone so sure. take with it that sure. is probably not what a quote would look like yeah. exactly but he did say to me it was $30,000. Okay so there's a cost but yeah I, all right I just wanted to get a sense of scale and if that's what you were sharing and I'll ask administration about that yeah. as well because I imagine that's one of the things that we need to manage and Sorry, go ahead. And if I could just add, in our conversation last week with administration, um, the cost was mentioned as a barrier, but not the primary one. I think okay. the primary one that we heard was uh, that, that they don't see the need to have that third party assessment, mm -hmm. um, that they feel they're doing sufficient work internally, uh, and that it sort of would end up being kind of a duplication. Yes. This is where our argument uh, of the trust factor or the deficit of trust really comes to bear. Um, it may well be that all that work is excellent. The problem right now is it's sort of locked behind a closed door that some people okay. don't have the key to. Sure, that makes sense. Okay, now uh, that's, that's great. I have a, a much better understanding. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Constant, and thank you so much for, uh, for coming. I do have a couple of questions to you. And uh, first of all, I was a founding member of uh, uh, Greater Edmonton Alliance. So I consider me a friend, right? And, uh, but I'm gonna ask you some questions that uh, might seem not, been, not inappropriate, but maybe a little tougher. Uh, and just wanna know, and thank you for being the voice of the community. But in order to be the true authentic voice of the community, your membership, membership, membership should also reflect the diversity of the community, right? And I don't see anyone here from indigenous communities and part of your group, or there's good, thank you so much. I don't see any from racialized communities, from black communities, right? I don't see non-Christian faiths being represented, right? So just wanna get an understanding as you advance your advocacy, challenge society to change, how would you change, right? That's one question, right? The second question I have is uh, uh, unions are your members, right? Unions have dual role in my mind. One is to push for change on behalf of their members, progressive change, and I appreciate that they do, but sometimes unions also end up defending the status quo, right? Or the people who may cause aggression in the workplace, right? So Could just, you repeat that last part? Uh, I just want to say uh, your unions are your members. Your, uh, they have dual role. Uh, one is to push for change, which I appreciate, and progressive change, look after the well-being of the employees. But when it comes to racism, discrimination, or aggressions in workplace, sometimes they end up defending the person who's actually causing that aggression, right? Because they have a duty to represent, right? So those are the two questions I have. Like, how do you navigate that? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, that's an accountable question that you asked us, the first one, yeah. and that's what we're all about, so thank you. Um, we are not representative at present of the wider, greater Edmonton area, but that is the top of the list priority at each one of our executive board meetings is okay. how do we get there? So okay. I'm pleased to report that we are uh, working with um, Islamic Community Family Services Good. to uh, try all of these let me back up for one second um, as GIA we're a broad-based coalition of institutions of civil society that includes as you know this but not everybody might your worship uh, labor institutions faith-based institutions and community service organizations uh, and so in order to build out that representative representation piece we uh, have struck 
recently a third action research team that's specifically working on uh, truth and reconciliation, leveraging the uh, IAF, which is our kind of parent organization, uh, a great educational uh, offering called, Rec um, you know, have to help me really, wrestling with the truth of colonization. Um, so that program is built in partnership from the ground up with Indigenous partners, just as one example. Also actively working with our, our Muslim uh, communities. Another um, initiative that we currently have going is with the uh, Edmonton Multicultural Coalition. So we're aware of our, our deficits and we're working hard to, the only other thing I would say about it, Your Worship, is just like everybody else, COVID has um, been so tough on institutions. We hear a lot about our small businesses and how hard COVID has been on them. Many of our community organizations, uh, organizations of civil society have really struggled. Some have not survived. And so um, we would love to speak to you about creative ways that we could re-enliven uh, some of those groups because there are no barriers to participation in our organization other than uh, time. Would love to help because uh, I really want you to be successful. I really want you to be the true boys of all the communities in, in Edmonton to push for progressive change and, uh, and better and inclusive Edmonton for all of us. Um, I'll, maybe I'll follow up with the union question later on uh, through. Uh, unless I'd you be have. happy to give you a short answer. Sure, please, yeah. In short, we have a legal responsibility to represent members fairly yeah. and without prejudice or bias or opinions. Yeah. Um, it is unfortunate if our members engage in credible and evidence-based behaviors that would require um, discipline in, under those parameters that you mentioned. Um, but beyond that, we, we certainly don't as a, I'll speak on behalf of Civic Service Union 52 if yeah. I may. And we certainly would not support hiding behaviors like that okay. or anything like that. You Thank show you. us evidence and we go through the process. It's our legal responsibility. Yes. Oh, I, I understand that. Thank you so much for that, actually. I'm, I'm actually heartened by, by your answer because uh, there's a change happening within the institutions all the institutions. So thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Jans, questions to the members of public? Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I just have my camera off because I'm in a low bandwidth space right now. Um, so I, I just, I want to summarize here. Um, administration suggested that we're meeting or exceeding the standard and that we're moving towards um, more regular reviews and next steps and pieces that would be forthcoming and um, I, I think I hear correct, if I hear correctly, the guests today are saying that, um, uh, yes, things are moving and we're having meetings and, and work is happening, but we're not, um, there's a lack of formal, is it a formalization that's missing here or is it a, a reporting piece or I'm just trying to get us, uh, I'm just trying to make sure I clearly understand what the ask is of the speakers. Thank you, Councillor Jens. Uh, I th think a way that we could characterize our uh, interest in having council um, take the standard as policy for the city is that it would essentially cr create a floor um, situation. Of course, we want to exceed that. That's the, the bare minimum is not uh, what we want for our people. But it, it, I guess we can also answer with a question is say, if we're meeting or exceeding the standard as it exists, and if we don't have anything bad to say about the standard, which I've never heard anyone say the standard is flawed, it doesn't address this, it doesn't address that. I've, we've never heard those critiques. We'd be happy to hear them if, the, if there are such critiques. But not having heard them, the only thing that we can assume is that the biggest reason for not wanting to entrench that standard is it's expedient than if there's ever a situation where it might be more cost effective or just convenient to go in a different direction. That, that's the only way that we could interpret it. Otherwise, it seems like I, I can remember even four years ago having this conversation with a then sitting councillor when we said, why is this, it seems like this should be dead easy. Why is this not already endorsed? And, and the councillor just said, that's the right question. 
And so we've been asking it since. Right. So you're saying we need a formal adoption by council that this should be policy and also that there should be a, a third party assessment. Is that correct? Yes, uh, we do think that the formal adoption of the policy is the way to go. It's, uh, I would like to echo my colleagues' uh, comments, but also add to that, that it's kind of like your uh, living wage policy. It, you already were a living wage employer, but now you've declared it and you've made it known that this is a value for the city of Edmonton and a leadership component for the rest of um, the area that you value this and, and its uh, official endorsement would say so loud and clear and go to that element with, with uh, your employees that you've now adopted this as policy. It, goes, it would go a long way, I think. And as far as the benchmark assessment, we do think that the uh, assessment is, is a tool that could not only give you a, a, a third party's evaluation uh, which engenders trust, which what we're, is our base uh, argument. However, it, I think it's also a good timing for that to happen as well as the city and AMSA and uh, other partners with AMSA are developing their audit tool that they could uh, use the benchmark out of Ex Excellence Canada as a a guide to help develop their own audit tool that it's already been built with Canadian Mental Health Association. This is the authority on this standard um, who built this tool. So if you have the introductory benchmark, um, I think it would be informative for the tool that they plan on building with AMSA going forward. I think it's perfect timing. Excellent, thank you. Uh, no further questions. Thank you, Councillor Jans. Thank you so much for being here today once again and waiting and your contribution and advocacy on behalf of our communities and employees. Appreciate that. We may actually have an answer to your question that you asked four years ago, right? So I'm going to go to Councillor Rutherford uh, for, for that. Councillor Rutherford? Yes, thank you. I think I'll just start off the hop by... Uh, you can step back. Administration no, we're going to, to ask forward. our administration to come up to, to the front. Yeah. So um, I would move that executive committee recommend to city council that the city of edmonton officially adopt the national standard of canada for psychological health and safety in the workplace as a benchmark for continual improvement and report back to committee annually on progress if i can introduce that quickly. please go ahead councillor rutherford for the benefits of the members of the public there's a motion on the screen uh, asking us to adopt the standards Go, go, go ahead, Councillor Rutherford. Yeah, and I think I want to start by saying that I, as, as, as great as I think this report is, I think that, that, that it needs to be a report that we have annually uh, so that we can have these discussions. I myself was a City of Edmonton employee, and I experienced both negative and toxic workplace culture. Um, and I know I'm not alone, and I know I'm not isolated, and I know some of it is still pervasive today. And... Um, I, I love the idea of continual improvement, but I have to ask myself, how can we continually improve if we don't have a standard as our benchmark? And I, and I don't understand the reluctance against this standard as that benchmark. I get that it might be changing over time, but if it's not gonna change for a year and a half or two years, and I suspect that even if it does change, it's not gonna change so substantively that workplace culture wouldn't still be a factor in standard workplace uh, psychological health. I specifically did not include a third party review because I do think that with both adopting it as a standard and with a annual reporting where we can compare, you know, how are we doing? How are these things working? And having this conversation annually, I don't think a third party is needed right now. I don't think it will augment. And I think that part of the the, the piece that was brought up by our speakers was the broken trust. And I worry that the methodology, even with an external audit, will not create the results or the answers that we need. And I think actually the work that we're doing now will create more robust um, cultural changes and shifts, uh, and we can keep continuing down this path that we are. So this is by no means saying that what we're doing isn't great. It's just saying, let's formalize that 
um, both formalize it in terms of uh, the benchmark and in terms of having this conversation on an annual basis. So that's the intent of this motion. Thank you, Councillor Rutherford. Questions to administration and on the motion, Councillor Knack. Uh, thanks, Mayor Sohi, and, and thanks for that introduction. Uh, appreciate that. So a, a few questions. One, I, I do just want to ask a little bit more about the third-party certification piece. So that one, I do imagine there is some cost. Is that the reason we haven't done that through, we have Glint surveys, we have other pieces that you feel sort of replace the need for that? Is that, is that ultimately why we're not looking at the third-party certification? So one of the important things to think about is that the standard was developed in 2013 when the legislation didn't actually include psychological health and safety. So the standard was focused on a separate aspect that is now embedded within the occupational health and safety legislation within Alberta. And so the fact that we have a certificate of recognition, which is an external audit every three years, covers psychological health and safety and all of the elements we've talked about today. So we, we believe we are meeting that uh, that certification on a three-year basis. Okay, so that's why specifically on that piece. Okay, I'll reflect on that a little more. Uh, I, I just want to ask, because generally I, I do support it, but I want to just, I'm not sure why we haven't done the stand, the, the uh, adopting the standard. I get the certification piece, you've raised that, but is there any reason why we shouldn't do this? I, I'm yes, Okay. there is. So one of the uh, important things to consider about the standard is, is there is an internal audit that is required okay. by the standard to formally adopt it. And that's why we spoke to it in, uh, in the presentation today yeah. and what, what was discussed previously. Uh, so that's a significant amount of resources uh, to conduct that. And really what's important to us is to making sure that that small but mighty mental health team has um, focus on the employees at, at every aspect um, while we are maintaining that uh, certificate of recognition on a three-year basis. So that is uh, a very important part of the, the of the standard that is required in order in order to formally adopt it. Can you give me a sense of scope and? Oh, I hate that I'm just about to say scope and scale. Uh, I'm having flashbacks. Um, uh, scope and scale of of what what that looks like then. Yeah, so um, there is actually an annex, if you were interested in looking at it, that's, that speaks to this specifically in, in the standard. But you have to have an internal audit program that includes auditor competency, the audit scope, the frequency of audits, the audit methodology, and the reporting requirements that would be uh, done at regular intervals. Um, so that would require, obviously, training of the auditors in, in these sections and um, uh, uh, for comparison purposes, there are 214 interviews that were conducted with leaders and, and workers across the organization this year in terms of our certificate of recognition. Um, to, to be equivalent, we would want to be in that sort of scope and range across the 73 lines of business. Mm -hmm. Just to supplement, I think, Councillor, what, what, Ms. Taylor, what uh, Sindel Taylor is saying is it's a resource issue simple put in really simple terms. She does not have an additional FTE to uh, focus on, on a full-time, she believes it will take a full-time person to complete the internal audit process at minimum for formal compliance with the standard. So that's, that's the only reason. Mm -hmm. And if we said, for example, uh, if council said, we're giving you an additional FTE and their sole focus will be to create and uh, implement an internal audit program in relation to the standard, that's something that we are not objecting to. We just do not have the capacity within our branch at this point to do that work. Correct, and I'll just supplement to that as well in terms of the the aspects that are required for the uh, different work areas as well. Um, upwards of 30 safety professionals spend months uh, in preparing the documentation and, and preparing for this uh, certificate of recognition audit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, no, I pr appreciate that point. I, I think that might be a worthwhile investment still though, So, I, but I appreciate your, your, your flag on that. Um, the other question I have, just relates to that uh, the last point that had been raised around access to the various audits and reports and you know I appreciate there's probably certain things that of course have sensitivities that you can't release but but beyond those things that probably have very clear sensitivities is there any reason why that information can't be shared more broadly or is there is it most of it is sensitive or 
So absolutely, that is something that we are working on right now. All of the areas of business are going through their recommendations from the auditor's report and setting what their uh, intentions are to, for lack of a better term, um, work on those rec recommendations over the next three years to be prepare, prepared for the next audit. Our intention was to release that information once it's been agreed to with timelines uh, appropriately. Um, uh, and the fact that we have passed is common knowledge. Um, we scored an 89 percent. Captain Mallard, the time I might come back. Thank you. Yeah, Constance Stevenson. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for the the very comprehensive report, uh, and so much great work that's happening. I think that was recognized by our speakers as well in terms of the programs that have been introduced, and and you know the clear clear intention around uh, addressing psychological safety. So thank you, thank you for that. I want to dig in a little bit more just around, um, yeah, we've talked about sort of the, the processes and programs, but not necessarily the outcomes and, and metrics. So just wondering what, uh, what you were considering in sort of that annual, um, you, know, I, 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 you know, I like the report back to committee, but the, you had suggested an annual memo, but just, yeah, what metrics were you considering including in that annual report back? So one of the metrics, and I'll ask uh, Chaplain Dowds to supplement after me, but one of, a few of the metrics that we have been looking at over uh, the past couple of years are the training of our working mind uh, as we want to achieve having all of our employees trained in the working mind, uh, as well as our leaders. We also regularly look at our EFAP statistics in, in terms of usage. Sorry, what's that? Uh, our Employee Family Assistance Program, that's LifeWorks, um, as well as um, we included an additional question on our Glint survey this year, uh, which was awareness of mental health supports, and that scored uh, the highest, actually, at a 75, and we'd like to drive that up to an 80 um, so that we know that employees are, are aware of and able to access those supports when it's needed. And yeah, that, those are those are great ones. Um, wondering if we'd also just look at overall Glint survey findings, for example, again, the engagement level of people participating, and also maybe looking at uh, leave as well, number of people on, on leave. Yes, we regularly look at those uh, statistics as well. Yeah. And that would be included in the report. In the report, back. yeah. Okay, and does that align, again, just sort of in terms of, um, and I, I'm sorry I didn't quite quite get this in the report, but the the adoption of the national standard, does that have set metrics that are reported on? Like does that come with a, a set evaluation framework or we would be developing our own evaluation framework? Uh, there are some aspects that are a, a requirement to look at, and there are other aspects are, that are a should. So the 13 factors are a should look at um, in terms of reporting, not a shall look at. And in terms of other metrics, they, they suggest similarly some that you should look at, mental uh, disability rates being one of them. Great, and has, have there been conversations, so, uh, you know, appreciate that that, that um, you know, reporting role comes a, with a one FTE, and again, I, I think that there's value in that, that resource uh, for sure. Just wondering if there's been any conversation between your group and the Office of the City Auditor in terms of uh, capacity and resources that they might have to, to support that work? We have had conversations with them about that. Uh, one and have not asked for their assistance at this point in time, specifically because we have been exploring the AMSA uh, capabilities with, with AMSA on their new uh, core element. So I, I'll just step out a little bit to say, I'm not sure that council is aware, but we actually pay a levy in our WCB premium to AMSA. Um, on a yearly basis. And so one of the things that we think is particularly uh, relevant and important about their new psychological health and safety element is that it will not only serve the city of Edmonton and, and employees in looking at psychological health and safety, but also other municipalities in, in Alberta that will be able to use that um, and look to the city for guidance. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Stevenson. Councillor Rice. Uh, thank you, Mayor Selhi. Um, so thank you for the uh, comprehensive report. Uh, 
that's just great information to say, and there are lots of good things there. Uh, first question about, um, so in the report indicated city is meeting or exceeding the 13 factors. Uh, does that mean we have identified more than 13 factors? And is, that, is there, can you give me some examples of other factors? And is that, so the, those 13 factors specifically and from standard, like national standards. So our city, we identify more than 13 factors. We measured against the 13 factors in the standard, but we recognize that there are additional factors that are being looked at specifically around inclusion and diversity, which we tried to incorporate into the 13 factors where we found it relevant. So does and that- And trauma. Does that, uh, is that safe to say, and then the, our current approach actually in place and already uh, implement the national standards and even beyond that? Is that safe to say that? I think it is safe to say that in the sense that, um, when, you know, the standard's been out since 2013 and uh, informally we've been using the standard as a benchmark as we've moved forward. Certainly I was, I was there actually at the advent of the, the rollout of the standard. And in the last number of years as a corporation we've recognized that we need to become more of a trauma-informed organization and so look at situations and context through the, through the lens or through the perspective of trauma. Um, and we've done that historically through uh, the peer support teams that we've had in place for around 30 years in community stand in the community services area in transit and in fire rescue and that was all primarily around uh, critical incidents traumatic incidents that folk in those areas might be involved in but we've expanded that greatly recognizing the fact that um, trauma for any and all of us can impact uh, our own lives our work lives and that if folk experience trauma at work uh, certainly the risk, is there, the risk is there in those particularly high uh, risk areas and high hazard areas, but the risk is there for all of us in a whole variety of ways. And so we've recognized that we really need to be a trauma-informed organization and doing a lot more in educating our, um, our people leaders and supervisors around that so that if there are incidents, that they will look at it from that perspective, okay. seeking to provide for people that way. Yeah. Uh, so then my question is, if we formally and officially adapt to the national standards, will this limit it uh, other factors we already considered in our current process? Or we still continue to do uh, some like to consider to include those factors we already and in the place. I don't think that this that the standard would limit us for con okay. from continuing so, to move forward. Okay, that's Absolutely. wonderful. I, I just yeah. want to understand. So another thing for the factors, certain factors, I do think, and from my own experience as a immigrants and also as a visible minority work in the workplace. So what I experienced, and is that anything we could do and to support and then people, our employee who work in the workplace but with different language level and then different cultures. And then I didn't say that reflect in the factors because that could changing how we respond to certain things and how we interact with certain things and then also to change how we feel some sense. And so that I think from that perspective, is there, I don't know, I have no answer for that. That is why I'm looking for and how those group and then right now we get more and more uh, those uh, like ethnic group people working in our workplace and how we ensure they feel, they, they feel safe, they feel included, they feel the way and then psychologically health support and for them as well. So I, I can give you a couple of examples, Councillor, and then I'll let um, Chaplain Dowds just jump in. So we d definitely have a series of different offerings and, and, and programs and, and um, aspects of our work that are focused on trying to build the most possible the most possible inclusive environment. So anti-racism training is one example. The respectful workplace training talks about, and there's a big component about implicit bias. So 
it helps people to understand we all bring biases and, and to be more aware of their biases and then how they can take steps to mitigate them. And that's mandatory training at the City of Edmonton. Um, we've got things like the Inclusive Language Guide and inclusive language practices where we try to um, identify in one, one another's usage of language that's not um, inclusive. And, and I mean, not a week goes by that I don't say something where someone has explained to me that that's problematic for this reason or that reason and it's, it's a learning journey that we're all on. Um, and so I feel like we, there's many different ways that we try to build more inclusive environments at the city where everyone can feel like they belong. Um, it's definitely our goal and our aspiration. And the, I guess the last thing I'd reference is our employer resource networks, which I've talked to you about before, but I will mention again, are such a critical um, um, group of employees, and we have employee resource networks for different um, types of identities uh, that bring advice and, and sound policy suggestions uh, to administration. I'll let John um, go, go from here. Uh, not yet. Come back. I have to come back a Apologize. second round. Yeah. Apologize. It's way over time. Uh, uh, just want to follow up on some questions as well. Uh, you know, I, I used to work for the city as well, and I had a very mixed experience, good and, uh, and bad. I think we do a good job of offering competitive wages and benefits to employees, but I don't think we, we should be actually striving to create a workplace where uh, where people feel they belong, right? That they are excited to come to work, right? Uh, so that sense of belonging, I hear from, we have heard, like I personally have heard, and my office have heard from some of the racialized employees who have left the organization that uh, they, were not, they, they lacked that psychological safety in the workplace and the comments we heard were being passed over for permanent or promotional opportunities or microaggressions from supervisors and uh, senior um, management, uh, not able to be their authentic self in the, uh, in the workplace uh, or uh, uh, or having their concern dismissed, not taken seriously, right? So I think just trying to understand the, how do we, how do we include those voices and hear those voices and then make changes, right? Uh, yes, we are on the right path, I'm not being, negative or anything, we're on the right path, but we want to be a place where people, we should be excited to come and work, right? So just want to get your thoughts. Well, I think I would never challenge or deny anyone's lived experience. And so if someone's saying that this is how they're experiencing life at the city, that they feel like they don't belong, that is a, you know, that is an absolute critically important part of our entire experience. And Mr. Mayor, I can tell you there's lots of people who are really excited to come work at the City of Edmonton. Those things are both true. It's not a binary choice. There are folks who are, there are racialized folks who are happy to come work at the city. And there are people who are white who are super unhappy about coming to work at the city. And so all those things are true. And our efforts are to try to identify areas where we can make progress, where we can build in, whether it's training or mentoring or policy changes, additional supports, like we're constantly looking and scanning to see where we can be an ever better employer. And so personally, I believe every person's voice matters and we have to listen to our employees and do what we can to respond to the concerns that they've raised. For those who feel their voices are not heard, and I'll come to uh, uh, John Yu on, like I, I have known you for, for such a long time. You're the most compassionate person that I have dealt with, and you deeply care for people. Uh, and uh, we also see that number of employees don't access the programs and services available. So 
how are we dealing with that, say if someone from indigenous background or racialized background or non-Christian background uh, wants to be seeking help constantly, right? But don't feel comfortable because of the the cultural, culture is different or, you know, uh, 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 the uh, their comfort level. I think what we've, what we have done and continue to try to do is to provide um, multiple points of entry for folk. Um, our peer support program, which has essentially exploded in a really good way over the last number of years, provides multiple points of entry for folk. And uh, the peer support program, the members in the peer support program are significantly diverse to create multiple points of entry. Uh, so that's one piece. Uh, the other piece is I'm only too cognizant of the fact that I'm white, I come from a Christian background, and I'm the old guy on the block. Um, but my, pers my position, as you know, is very much an interfaith position, but historically my, I am from the Christian community. And so one of the things that um, I've been working on over the last number of years is to build out the capacity of the chaplaincy program so that not only is it seen to be interfaith, but it is interfaith. And uh, currently, um, I'm adding a rabbi to the on-call chaplaincy piece and uh, looking for a Muslim chaplain to join the chaplaincy program as well. Unfortunately, I haven't got anybody specifically yet, but do have one who's working in an advisory capacity with me. So we're, we're um, recognizing that diversity. Um, if I'm running out of time, please tell me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the other piece is that certainly our RFP for our new EAP, wonderful acronyms, uh, when we decided to move from Homewood Health to a new uh, EAP provider, we m made sure that we looked at that through a GA GBA plus lens perspective yeah. to make sure that there would be accessibility for our diverse population base, yeah. not only in terms of um, ethnicity, but in terms of language, et cetera, et cetera, and any abilities that may be limiting for people. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you for that. And we are, um, we are out of time. Okay. That's why I think having this annual report will be so helpful for us to continue to ask these questions on an ongoing basis. So thank you. I'll go to Councillor Rutherford next. Yeah, I guess, you know, just again, interested in the core program looks at oh and S holistically. It's not a a hyper lens on the psychological safety, is that correct? Yes, so it looks at all aspects of, of the health and safety system, but the health and safety system specifically implements psychological as well as physical safety. The two are, are synonymous in today's uh, aspects. Um, and that's why I really wanted to highlight, um, if you'll permit me, the aspects of the AMSA tool um, because that will draw out the pieces we are very excited to highlight in our next um, our next audit. And so um, those, they, they use the same elements, but they are looking at um, the integration of psychological health and safety into our, do into our documentation, written responsibilities for psychological health and safety, specifically for all levels of the organization, um, the evaluation of psychological hazards, that is in the core audit now, but it would put a greater focus on that to be able to present that information um, next year uh, to council in the form, whatever form of reporting that that's looked at. Okay, but when I hear, so with the, the national standard, the concern is there's, so as the motion is written, it says officially adopt the national standard. So to adopt that national standard, you have to do an audit annually? Is that what the issue is? Yes, we would have to do an internal audit to meet that standard. But didn't you already do that to create this report? That. Uh, like in a way, because you said that you meet or exceed all of those 13. Uh, no, an auditor themselves, like certified as an auditor, did not prepare this, this report to council. A certified auditor did meet the requirements. It's an external body. They are a certified auditor. They audited us for our core. They're, they are different. No, no, but I'm talking about the national. So... So you're saying that you don't have capacity, because I'm just trying, what I'm, tr there's a continual improvement, 
but I'm just, I'm not hearing the benchmarks. So are the benchmarks then the national standards or the benchmarks other things that aren't included in this report? Like I'm not getting clarity on what are the actual benchmarks in which year over year we're gonna be measuring ourselves against. And that is what this intent of this motion is to do, is to say, it may be more than those 13, but at least these 13 are things that we're gonna measure ourselves against. So yeah. can you answer? I can that? answer that. So uh, th that aspect uh, and the r reason that the motion was uh, the way it was last year was because it was specifically about those 13 factors um, and, and benchmarking against the all aspects of the standard, but the 13 factors specifically, which is what we highlighted in the report. So year over year after year, we would give you reporting on how we are measuring against those 13 factors without doing an official meets the compliance aspects from an ethical obligation of an auditor did this internally, my team would do this internally for you and report on it. Okay, but you said, you th but then would there be capacity for that? Because I know there's capacity concerns. Um, and then I guess one other thing is like, if we did the Glint survey, how come those results weren't in this report? So, Councillor, we do, um, there's two kinds of Glint surveys. There's one that's done every four months, um, used to be every three, now it's every four, which is a shorter version of the survey. The one that was referenced by the speakers today is the biannual one, and it's actually live right now. So, this, so every two years we do this extensive survey on demographics, respectful workplace, et cetera. Yep. And that one is live right now, it is not closed yet. So we will be and can advise council of the results of that survey in uh, November sometime. I think it closes October 27th. But that would be even more reason that like, it would be great to, because that would probably go into the next report if we, if we have a oh, report to council. Absolutely, kind of we can in include that, yes. Yeah. So I guess I'm just, I, in my 30 seconds left, I'm just trying to understand, is it just the words officially adopt? So is it, could, it, could we say, utilize the national standards of Canada for cycle so that we again we're seeing it. yes like, what I, is the concern I, here? I the wording of formally adopt is what what is causing us concern yeah. because that requires us to meet all of the aspects and if I, it's to benchmark against then absolutely we're, I know exactly, we're with you I know you're talking about the subscription to certain things like even becoming like a certified youth-friendly city right like yes there are certain benchmarks. yes um, so I would I would accept that from a councillor uh, colleague. What was the what you suggesting, councillor? Uh, Change officially to officially. Ad I can't amend my own no, motion. Just, so I, I can amend it. Just one and one. So officially word, adopt to utilize the. Okay, City of Edmonton utilize the national uh, standards. Canada. Okay, so delete officially adopt to utilize. Okay, that's friendly. No, not friendly. Okay, then we have to stop here and carry, we have to carry on the conversation at the next executive committee, because we are at 458. And Mr. Mayor, do we need to make some motions to move things to the next yeah. agenda? Yeah. So, um, if city clerk can help me with that. So, the remaining items that will need to be moved over to the next executive committee. So we still have 7.6 bylaw 20304, City of Edmonton Ward Boundaries and Council Composition Bylaw Amendment Number 4. Um, this item, the Employee Psychological Health and Safety Programs and Practices. And we also have item 9.1, Rationalizing and Right Sizing Municipal Assets. Okay. Great. So you will, Councillor Stevenson moved. is moving that? Okay, please vote. Wait. No. May I, I can't click in. I, I have a question about the oh. motion, about okay. 9.1. Okay, go ahead. And just the timing, I'm worried from a budgetary perspective that moving it to the next exec. So should it, should it be, should that one be deferred? So that one should, should that one just be put on the council agenda is my question to administration. Sorry, sorry to no, keep no, us longer, fine. but that's I just, a, that's fine. I know that if we're it can, get, we've, we've bumped that one already once. If so. it can go to council, that would be a good idea. Uh, sorry, rationalizing assets? Yeah. Um, it, it's council's discretion, or sorry, committee's discretion if you want to requisition this to council. Um, we don't have any problems with that. If it goes to the next committee meeting, uh, we don't have problems with that. Okay. Our only 
wish, desire, hope is that it's presented and we have a discussion with committee council before we get into budget deliberations. So the only drawback of uh, uh, sending it to council would be that it may be some at the bottom of the agenda, may not get dealt at the committee, but if we refer it to committee, it will be the third item on the agenda. So we will at least get to it at the executive committee. I don't think so, because there's time-specific interviews. So just a friendly reminder that at ARC there are interviews set at the next executive yeah. committee meeting, so we will need to do some okay. prioritizing, so and it'd be helpful I would, if we did I that would. now. We need two people to uh, requisite it. So can I requisition, requisition. 9.1? Yeah, okay, 9.1 is requisited to council. You'll find a time for us to deal with at next council meeting, okay? Because we would have to deal with it before budget. Okay, anything else? Any other questions? Councillor Rice? Okay. Yeah, because we're at five o'clock. <laughs> okay. We still need to move. Yeah, we need to move. Uh, please vote. For seven point six and seven point eight. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so seven point six and seven point eight will be uh, will go to next executive committee. Okay. So we are not moving for this motion. Nope. The yeah, we will deal with that at the next. Executive committee meeting. Yeah. We have five votes. Uh, display the votes, please. That is carried. Uh, motion spending none. Notice of motions or motions without customary notice. No. No. And we are adjourned. <laughs>